This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. I've gone through a lot of phases on coffee. I yeah. used to, in college, I would go super deep into, you know, grinding fresh beans, all of that kind of stuff, water temperature exactly right. And then I hit a phase where I was just, it was the maintenance dose. Then I went to like espresso because I could get a lot more in. Yeah. And now I go through phases of like, sometimes I like it with a little oat milk, sometimes a little half and half in sugar. If I'm oh, you've gotten it. soft in your old age. I've gone a little, I, I have. But hey, if I'm doing a SBF interview, it's black that day, nothing less. Yeah. It's black, no the sugar. The lights go down. I think a lot of it's preparation. And then once it happens, it's mostly fueled by sort of adrenaline, I would say. Um, I really deeply care about getting to like the root cause of some of these issues because I think so often people in positions of power are let off the hook. So I really care about holding their feet to the fire and it translates into like a lot of energy the day of. So I, I never find myself like, funny enough, I usually drink a lot of caffeine leading up to the interview. And then I try to drink like minimum the day of because I have so much adrenaline. I don't want to be like hyper stimulated. Yeah. So Sam Bankman Freed is a kid who grew up sort of from a position of huge privilege. Both his parents are lawyers. I believe both of them were from Harvard. He went to MIT, went to like, or sorry, backing up a bit more. He went to like this top prep high school then to MIT, then he went to Jane Street. And after that, he get started a trading firm in, I think, 2017 called Alameda Research with a few friends. Some of them were from Jane Street. Some of them worked at Google. And they were sort of the smartest kids on the block, or that's what everyone thought. They made a lot of their money on something called the kimchi premium, or at least this, the story goes, which just to explain that, uh, the price of Bitcoin in Korea was substantially higher than in the rest of the world. And so you could arbitrage that by buying Bitcoin elsewhere and selling it on a Korean exchange. So they made their money early doing kind of smart trades like that. They flipped that into market making, which they were pretty early on that, um, just providing liquidity to ex an exchange. And it's what's, it's a strategy that is considered delta neutral, which means basically if you take kind of both sides of the trade and you're making a spread, like a, a fee on that, you make money whether it goes up or down. So in theory, there shouldn't be that much risk associated with it. So Alameda kind of blew up because they would offer these people, you know, people who are giving out loans, they'd say, hey, we'll give you this really attractive rate of return. And we're doing strategies that seemingly are low risk. So we're a low risk bet. We're these smart kids from Jane Street. And you can kind of trust us to be this smarter than everyone else kind of thing. Uh, around 2019, Sam started FTX, which is an exchange. Uh, specifically, it specialized in derivatives. So like margins, kind of more sophisticated crypto products. And it got in with Binance early on. So Binance actually has a prior relationship to FTX, which we'll explore in a second because they're going to play a role in FTX's collapse, actually. Binance is the number one uh, crypto exchange. And they're led by, uh, he's called CZ on Twitter. I don't want to butcher his full name, but um, really smart guy has played his hand really well and built up a quite large exchange. And Binance was funding a bunch of different like startups. So they funded, they helped invest into FTX early on. They invested a hundred million. So these guys were kind of like teammates early on, SBF and CZ. And FTX quickly grew. They got like, especially in 2020, 2021, they got a lot of endorsements. They got a lot of credibility in the space. And eventually FTX actually bought out Binance. They gave them $2 billion. So pretty good investment for, for CZ in a couple of years. Um, and now lead that up to 2022, what happens? Luna collapse, Three Arrows Capital collapse, which if you don't know, there's just these kind of cataclysmic events in crypto. Uh, led by some pretty risky behavior, whether Luna was a token that promised really attractive returns that were unsustainable ultimately, and it just kind of spiraled. It did what's called a, a stable coin death spiral, which we can talk about if we need to. 
Yeah, it's weird because on the one hand, cryptocurrency is supposed to somewhat simplify or add transparency to the financial markets. The idea is for the first time, you don't have to wait for an SEC filing from some corporate business. You can look at what they're doing on chain, right? Um, so that's good because a lot of big financial problems are caused by lack of transparency mm -hmm. and lack of understanding risk. But ironically, you get some people creating these arbitrarily complicated financial products like algorithmic stable coins, which then introduce more risk and blow everything up. So anyways, uh, three arrows capital blew up. And all of a sudden, this crypto industry, which everyone thought was going to the moon, Bitcoin to 100,000, is in some trouble. And FTX seems like the only people who, besides like Binance, who's also really big and stable, and Coinbase, uh, they seemed like they were doing fine. In fact, they were bailing out companies in the summer. I don't know if you remember that SBF was likened to like Jamie Diamond, who's the you know uh, CEO of Chase, who like kind of was like the buck stops here. Uh, you know, I'm like the backstop, right? So SBF was supporting the industry. He was like the stable guy. So come to like around October and November, there's all this talk about regulation. Everything's been blowing up. SBF's leading the charge on regulation. And CZ, the CEO of Binance, gets word that maybe SBF is kind of like cutting him out or making regulation that would maybe impact his business. And uh, he doesn't like that too much. They start kind of feuding a little bit on Twitter. So when it comes out, a Coindesk report came out that FTX's balance sheet wasn't looking that good. Like it looked pretty weak. They had a lot of coins that in theory had value if you looked at their market price. But for a, a variety of reasons, if you tried to sell them, they'd collapse in value. So it's sort of like this thing, a house built on sand. And uh, a friend of mine on Twitter, he goes by Dirty Bubble Media. He released a report and he basically said, I think these, uh, these guys are insolvent. Well, CZ saw that. And he retweeted it and started adding fuel to the fire of like the speculation. Because up to this point, everyone thought FTX is super safe, super secure. There's no reason to not keep your money there. Tom Brady keeps his money there, whatever. And CZ kind of fuel, adds fuel to the fire by saying, not only am I retweeting this, adding kind of like validity to this speculation, but also I'm going to take the FTT that I got, which part of their balance sheet was this FTT token, which is FTX's like proprietary token. And Alameda and uh, FTX controlled a lot of it. They were using this token to basically be a, a large amount of collateral for their whole balance sheet. So it accounted for this huge amount of their value. And the CEO of Binance had a huge chunk of it as well. And he said, I'm going to sell all of it. And the, I, the fuel that that introduced to the market is if he sells all this FTT, and this FTT is underwriting a lot of the value of FTX. sort of was this proxy because what FTX was committed to doing was sort of like buying back FTT tokens. They would do right. this thing called the buy and burn. I think there was some amount of sharing in the revenue fees of FTX. It was kind of this convoluted thing. In my opinion, the exact value of FTT was speculated from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And it was clear that it was very tied to the performance of FTX, which is important because we'll get to later, FTX sort of built their whole scaffold on FTT, which meant that this scaffold was very wobbly because if FTX loses a little bit of confidence, then your value goes down. When your value goes down, you lose more confidence and this goes down. So it was kind of like this thing that this flywheel that when it was going well, you got huge amounts of growth. When it's going bad, you get a uh, exchange death spiral, <laughs> so, so to speak. <laughs> No, because I think sophisticated traders always think in terms of diversification and correlation. So if you're trying to, the way to think about risk in investing is like, if I invest in you, Lex Friedman, and then I also invest in some product you produce, those, those, the performance of those two things will be pretty correlated. Yes. So whether I invest in you or I invest in this product that you like are completely behind, I'm not de-risking. I'm basically counting all on you doing well, right? Mm -hmm. And if you do bad, my investments do very bad. So if I'm trying to build a stable thing, I shouldn't put all my eggs in the Lex Friedman basket 
unless I'm positive that you're going to do well, right? And these people- As your financial advisor, I would definitely yeah. recommend you do not put all your eggs in this basket. Right. And so you can think about it like, if I know that, these people were trained to think like this. Yeah. And so the idea that you could start this exchange, you're worth billions of dollars, and you underwrite your whole system by betting, putting most of it on your own token is is insane. And what And what's crazy- is we'll later find out that they were basically taking customer assets, which were real things like Bitcoin and Ethereum with with risks that were not so correlated to FTX, and they were swapping them out. They were using to go, go basically gamble those and putting FTT in its place as, quote, value. So they were increasing the risk of the system in order to bet big with the idea that if they bet big and won, we'd all be singing their praises if we bet big and lost, if they bet big and lost, I don't know if they had a plan, but I think they were, I think they were being extremely risky and there's no way to avoid their knowledge of that. Right. And FTX was pretty clear from the beginning that they wouldn't invest your assets in anything else. They wouldn't do anything else with it. They wouldn't trade it. That's what made FTX so such like a horror story for investor confidence is basically they made every signal that they would not do anything nefarious with your tokens. They would just put them to the side, put them in a separate account that they don't have access to, and they just kind of wait there until the day that you're ready to withdraw them. Mm -hmm. uh, that's explicitly what they told their customers. So going back to the story a little bit, CZ then says, hey, I'm selling this token that underwrites the value of FTX. There's a total panic. SBF during this time makes set, says several lies, such as FTX assets are fine. We have enough money to cover all withdrawals. Um, and a day later, he basically admits that that wasn't the case. They don't have the money. They're shutting down. And then a few days later after that, they declared bankruptcy. There's, I should be clear, there's Alameda Research, FTX International and FTX US, which is the US side of things. Mm -hmm. These are three different entities. All of them are in bankruptcy. And it's not clear to the extent that they were commingling funds, but it's clear that they were commingling funds to some extent. So they kind of were t taking from each other. And that is where the fraud happens, right? Because if going back to our earlier analogy, if you're supposed to set funds aside, and I find out you were using it to go make all these arbitrage trades or do market making or all these activities you were known for, for your like hedge fund trading firm thing. That's a huge problem because you, he basically lied about this. Mm -hmm. And, uh, especially when he's saying explicitly that we have these things, we have these funds and these things turn out to be lies. Well, again, the question of fraud comes in and it's just like, there's no way he didn't know. So the obvious question might be, well, why isn't he locked up? Why, why is he running around? And it's because, um, Really, his story is that he didn't know any of it. He found out that they had to steal Mana's position. He would say he was totally disconnected from what Alameda was doing. He had no idea that they had such a large margin position that they had an accounting quirk and that accounting quirk hit $8 billion from, um, from his view. And so when he was saying that they had money to cover it, he was saying that truthfully to the best of his ability. And he just was so distracted at the time that he made a series of increasingly embarrassing mistakes. And now he owes it to the people to right those wrongs by publicly making this huge apology tour. So you might have seen him on, I mean, he's been talking to nearly everyone um, about basically how he's just didn't know what he's doing. He's the stupidest man alive. Uh, so what, 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 what are some interesting things you've learned from those interviews? I think I've appreciated why you don't talk in that position. Uh, most people wouldn't talk. Most people would listen to their legal counsel and and not talk. I do not think he's any lawyer worth their salt would tell him to talk because right now, I think the danger of what he's doing is he's locking himself into a story of how things happened. And I don't think that story is going to hold up in the coming months because I think it's impossible from the insider conversations I've had with Alameda Research employees, with FTX employees, it's impossible to square what they are telling me with no like incentive to lie with what SBF is telling me with every incentive to lie, which is fundamentally 
that he didn't know they were commingling funds. He didn't know they were gambling with cu customer money. And it was basically this huge mistake. And it's Alameda's fault, but he wasn't involved in Alameda, a company he owned. Sure, I should say first, this was not a willing interaction. I mean, I thought that was kind of the funny part of it because I've been asking him for an interview for a while. He's been giving interviews to nearly everyone who wants one, big channels, small channels. Um, he didn't give me one, but I managed to get some by sneaking up on some Twitter spaces and DMing the people and like being like, hey, can I come up? So I didn't get him to ask everything that I wanted because he like would leave sometimes, uh, you know, after I asked some of the questions. But really what I asked was about this 8 billion and zooming in on the improbability of his lack of knowledge. Um, it's sort of like if you if you run a company and you know the insides and outs and you're the top of your field, top top in class. And all of a sudden it all goes bust and you say, I had no idea how any of this worked. Yeah, I didn't I didn't know. It's like the guy who runs Whataburger saying, I didn't know where we sourced our beef. I didn't know where we that's a Texas example, actually. Thank you. I appreciate uh, that. Let's let's take it like worldwide Walmart. Like, I didn't know we used Chinese manufacturers. It's like that's impossible to become Walmart. You have to know how like how your supply chain works. You have to know even if you're at a high level, you know how this stuff works. Especially if all the insiders are coming out and saying, no, 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 of course he knew. He was directing us from the top. I mean, um, what was clear, what's interesting about the structure and like, I love the nitty gritty. Sorry, we're back to SBF. We yeah. went to Hitler. Sorry. Now we're sorry. back to I the wanted SBF. to turn us as fast as possible away from <laughs> Hitler. Um, I, yeah. I, I So the insiders in what? Alameda Research. Alameda Research. Alameda Research. What was interesting is that there was this sort of one-way window going on between Alameda and FTX, where FTX employees didn't know a lot of what was going on. Alameda insiders, and I would say by design, knew almost everything that was going on at FTX. Um, and so I think that was really interesting from the perspective of a lot of the so-called, like what you could, what he's trying to ascribe to as like failures or mistakes or ignorance and negligence, when looked at closely, are much more designed and they sort of don't arise spontaneously. Mm -hmm. Cause like, let's say, so there's this thing in banking and like trading where if I run a bank and you run like a trading firm, we need to have informational walls between us cause there's huge conflicts of interest that can arise, right? So the negligent argument might be that like, oh, we just didn't know we're sort of these dumb kids in the Bahamas. So we shared information equally. But when you see a one-way wall that starts to look a lot different, right? If I have a back-end source of looking at, or sorry, you're the trading firm. So mm -hmm. you have a back-end way to look at all my accounts. And I have no idea that you're doing that. That all of a sudden looks like a much more designed thing. When it would be plausible, let's say, going to, to, to use another, another analogy too. If you're saying, look, I commingled funds because I was so bad at corporate structures. Mm -hmm. You would expect those companies to have a very simple corporate structure because you didn't know what you're doing, right? But what we see with FTX and Alameda is they had something like 50 companies and subsidiaries and this impossibly complicated web of corporate activity. You don't get there by accident. You don't wake up and go, oh, I designed like this watch that ticked a very specific way, but it was all accidental. If you really didn't know what you were doing, you'd end up with a simple structure. So even just like from a fundamental perspective, what SBF was doing and like the activities they were engaging in were so complicated and purposely designed to obfuscate what they were doing. It's impossible to subscribe to the negligence argument. And I want to quickly say too, like, I don't think a lot of people have honed in on this. There was insider trading going on from Alameda's perspective where they would know what coins FTX was going to list on their exchange. And there's a famous effect where Let's say you're this legitimate exchange. You list a coin, the price spikes. Mm -hmm. Insiders told me it was a regular practice for Alameda insiders to know that FTX was going to list a coin and as a company buy up that coin so they could sell it after it listed. And they made millions of dollars. How do you do that accidentally? Yeah, and that's, that's illegal. Totally right. illegal. Right. So that's illegal from like, and if an individual does it, it's illegal, it's fraud. What if a company is systematically doing it? 
And you can't tell me that FTX or someone at FTX wasn't feeding that information about to Alameda or somehow giving them keys to know that. And that would happen at the highest level. It would happen at F SPS level. And this is why his arguments of I was dumb, I was naive, I was sort of ignorant are so preposterous because he's dumb and ignorant the second it becomes criminal to be smart and sophisticated, right? Yeah, so it's really interesting because it's sort of like wire fraud. It, you're sort of, he's sort of copping to like smaller crimes to avoid the big crime. The big crime is you knew everything and you were behind it, right? The smaller crimes are like <laughs> a little wire fraud here, a little wire fraud there. So what the $8 billion is, is that FTX didn't always have banking. It's hard to get banking as a crypto exchange. There's all these questions of like, where's the money coming from? Is it coming from money launderers? So for a variety of reasons, it's always been hard for exchanges to get bank accounts. So before, when FTX was just getting started, they didn't have a bank account. So how do you put money on FTX? Well, they would have you wire your money to their trading firm. Their wiring instructions would go to their trading firm. It's easier to get banking as a trading firm. So you'd put your money with the trading firm and then they'd credit you the money on FTX. Mm -hmm. Okay, first of all, this is a whole circumvention of all these banking guidelines and regulations. That's the first like thing that I think is legal. But basically what SBF argued is that there was an accounting glitch error problem where when you'd send money to Alameda, even though they'd credit you on FTX, they wouldn't safeguard your deposits. Like your deposits would go into what he called a stub account, which is just like some account that's not very well labeled, um, kind of like a placeholder account. And he didn't realize that th those were Alameda's funds or they were playing with those funds and that they basically should have safeguarded that for customers. That's his explanation. It's preposterous because it's $8 billion. But anyways. Um, just poor labeling of accounts. Of an eight billion dollar account. I mean, What's it's like a billion between a billion. This is I, like I do what, this all the time. This is the craziest thing. Like he was he was talking to me, and at one point in the conversation, he's like, "Yeah, I didn't have precise not because he said I didn't have knowledge of Alameda's accounts." And I said, "Well, Forbes a month ago was getting detailed accounting of Alameda," and he goes, "Oh, that wasn't detailed accounting. I just knew I was right within ten billion or so." What is that error margin? $10 billion for a company that is arguably never worth more than $100 million. Yeah. Ne probably never, never even worth more than $50 billion. Your error margin is $10 billion. You have to be, this is a guy who is sending around statements that like there was no risk involved. And you're telling me he had an error margin of $10 billion? That is the difference between like a healthy company and a company so deep underwater you're going to jail. So it, it, you have to believe that he is impossibly stupid and square that with the sophistication that he brought to the table. It's an, I, I think it's an impossible argument. I, I don't even think okay. it's. He's not incompetent. So the I think he's some combination of insane and evil, but it's impossible to know unless we know deep inside his heart how self like deluded he is versus a calculated strategy. And I think if you look at SBF, he's such a, I think he's a fascinating individual. Just, I mean, you know, he's a horrible human being. Let's start there. But he's also somewhat um, interesting from a psychology perspective because he's very open about the fact that he understands image and he understands how to cultivate image, the importance of image so well that I think a lot of people, even though they've talked about it, aren't emphasizing that enough when interacting with him. This is a man whose entire history is about cultivating the right opinions at the right time to achieve the right effect. Why do you think he would suddenly change that approach when he has all the more reason to cultivate an image? So he is extremely good naturally or uh, I don't know if he's good, but he's like, he's a hyper aware. So he's deliberate in cultivating a public image and controlling the public sure. image. You you know about the like Democrat donations. Like he, he knew to donate to the right people, $40 million. He says on a call that we released with Tiffany Fong, he says on a call that he donated the same amount to Republicans. There's speculation on whether this is true because he's a liar, whatever. 
So caveat there. But he said he donated to Republicans the same amount, but he donated dark because he knew that most journalists are liberal and they would kind of hold that against him. So he wanted all the all the sides to be on in his favor, in his pocket, while simultaneously understanding the entire media landscape and playing them like a fiddle by cultivating this image of I'm this progressive, woke billionaire who wants to give it all away, do everything for charity. I drive a Corolla while living in a million dollar penthouse, multimillion. Um, but but that was sort of the angle. He he understood so well how to play the media. And um, I do, I think he underestimated when he did this how much people would put him under a deeper microscope. And I don't think he has achieved the same level of success in cultivating this new image because I think people are so skeptical now. No one's buying it. But I think he he's trying it. He's doing it to the best. But it- Hundred percent. Yeah. Somebody from Sequoia Capital, you know, wrote this glow- glowing review that he's going to be the world's first trillionaire. There's so many pieces done on he's the most generous billionaire in the world that um, he was sort of like the steel man of, you know, it's possible to make tons of money. This is like the effect of altruism movement. Make as much money as you can, as fast as you can, and then give it all away. And he was sort of like the the poster child for that. And he did give some of it away and got a lot of press for it. And I think that was kind of by design. I want to address a real quick point. Yes. A lot of people have said that like Binance played a role. And while they catalyzed this, insolvency is a problem that will eventually manifest either way. So I don't put any blame on CZ for basically causing this meltdown. The The underlying foundation was unstable and it was going to fall apart at the next push. I mean, he just happened to be the final kind of like, uh, I don't know, the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah, the catalyst that revealed. But the fraud. Yeah, but it's like, I don't, I don't think he's culpable for FTX's like malfeasance in how they handled accounts, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I mean, probably, uh, I don't know. I, I would see some kind of weird obligation, like with the $2 billion they made on FTX. Remember, they got $2 billion, some of it in cash, some of it in, some of it in FTT tokens. So I don't know how much actual cash they have from that deal. But they have billions from the success of what seems to be a fraud. It seems to have been a fraud from early on. They had the back door as early as 20, early 2020, from what I can tell. No, I think I think CZ is like he's a shark. I think he's he's good at building a big business. Um, like a good I shark don't, or a bad shark? I don't know. I don't know. I think sharks just eat. I mean, I, I don't. I don't know. I think uh, my relationship with shark has like finding Nemo. There's a shark in that. Sure. I don't know. So I think like it, Jeff Bezos is a shark. Okay. So whether you, people have loaded connotations of like how they feel about Jeff Bezos, I mean, I, I would say like I think CZ is a ruthless businessman. Mm-hmm. I think he's cold. He's calculated. He's very um, deliberate. And I think uh, what he should do in this position is forfeit the funds that he profited from that investment. Because largely, I think it was um, it's owed to the customers. There's so much hurting out there. So I think I think they could do a lot of good around that. Um, I don't know if they will, because I don't know if he sees it in his best interest. I think that's probably how he's thinking. But yeah, I, I think uh, they could have helped, or they c- could still help there. Who do you think suffered the most from this so far? The little account holders. This is always true. So one of the big temptations with fraud, I've covered a lot of scams, frauds, is everyone looks at the big number, everyone, that's the headline, billions of dollars, the top 50 creditors, or what everyone thinks at first. Uh, But quickly, when you dig down, you realize that most people who lost $10 million, I mean, I'm sure that's terrible for them. I wish them to get their money back. But uh, it's usually the people with like 50,000 or less that are most impacted. Usually they do not have the money to spare. Usually they're not diversified in a sophisticated way. Um, So I think it's those people. I think it's the small account holders that I feel the worst for. And unfortunately, they often get the least press time or airtime. What's so brutal about this is that this all comes on the back, the entire crypto market comes on the back of 
comes from the deep distrust of traditional finance, right? Yeah, 2008, everybody lost trust in the banking systems. And they lost trust that if those banking systems acted in a corrupt way, that they would receive the justice. It turned out that the banks received favorable treatment. People didn't. So people lost faith in the the structure of our financial system in a way that is we're still feeling the reverberations of it. And so when crypto came along, it was like kind of this way to reinvent the wheel, reinvent the world for the the like sort of lowly and the like less powerful and kind of level the playing field. So what's so sad about events like this is you see that fundamentally a lot of the the power structures are the same where the people at the top uh, face little repercussions for what they do. The people at the bottom are still getting screwed. The people at the bottom are still getting lied to and law enforcement is way behind the ball. Do you think this really uh, damaged people trust in cryptocurrency? For sure. Way bigger than uh, Luna, way bigger than Three Arrows Capital. It's because of who SBF was. It's not just the dollar figure behind it. It's because he wooed so many of our media elites who should have been calling him out or at least investigating him and not rubber stamping him. It's an indictment of our financial system, even our most sophisticated people in BlackRock, in Sequoia, who didn't see this coming, who also rubber stamped him. Um, and you just wonder, like, if you can't trust the top people in crypto who are supposedly the good guys, the guys saving crypto I, month, just a month ago or two months ago, he was the guy on Capitol Hill that was talking to Gary Gensler, to all the top people in Washington. He was orchestrating the regulation of crypto. If that guy is a complete fraudster, liar, psychopath, and nobody knew it until it was too late, what does that mean about the system itself that we're building? Yes. So funny enough, like one of my videos from six months ago or so blew up because um, I got to give a lot of credit to Matt Levine of Bloomberg, great journalist, great finance journalist. And I want to say when I like talk about media elite, there are people doing great work in these mainstream institutions. It's not a monolith, just like independent media isn't all doing great work and all the corporate media is bad or whatever. There's like these overarching narratives that I don't subscribe to. So Matt Levine's a great journalist. He he did an interview with SBF where he got Sam to basically describe a lot of what was going on in DeFi, but it kind of a larger philosophy around crypto. And he described a Ponzi scheme where he just described this black box. It does nothing. But if we ascribe it value, then we can create more value and more value and more value. And it kind of was this ridiculous description of a Ponzi scheme, but there was no moral judgment on it. It was like, oh yeah, this is great. We can make a lot of money from this. Mm -hmm. And Matt is like, well, it sounds like you're in the Ponzi business and, and business is good. Mm -hmm. I made a video about that. I said, this is ridiculous. This is absurd, whatever. It's obscene. But um, I didn't explicitly call SBF a fraud there. And I think if, if I'm being, I think I saw some of it, but like many people, I think a, a lot of us were kind of like, I think a lot of us missed how wrong everyone could be at the same time. I did notice leading up to the crash what was happening, and I and I called it out a day a day or a day and a half before it happened because I saw my friends post a dirty bubble media, and this was the first real look into the heart of their finances because they're this black box. So you just kind of had to evaluate them without knowing much, and. Once we got a peek under the hood of what their finances were, I realized, oh my gosh, these guys might be completely insolvent. So I made a tweet about it. I hope some people saw it and got their money out. Um, but pretty quickly after that, I caught the narrative of what was really going on at Alameda, that it was basically this Ponzi scheme they, that they had built. Yeah, I think- In your-, in your uh, ten billion dollars to ten, ten million dollars. Ten million dollars. We're, we're working our way there. Um, with with a bunch of sure, cocaine like on it, the it's, table. it's never enough. It's never enough. Like you always could be catching stuff sooner. You always could be doing more. This is this is one thing that I don't understand too. Is like I think it's one thing to not see something. 
I think it's another thing to like rubber stamp or explicitly endorse. I feel like a lot of people didn't look too close at SBF because I think a lot of the warning signs were there. But my feeling is if you're a Sequoia, if you're a BlackRock, wouldn't you do that due diligence? I mean, like, yeah. they, like before just endorsing something, especially in the crypto space, this is just why I don't do any deals in the crypto space ever. Because it's impossible to know which ones are going to be the like big hits or the big frauds or, you know, whatever. Um, but if you're going to make that bet, if you're going to make that play, you would think that you would do all the research in the world and you would get sophisticated looks at their liabilities, at how they were structured, all that stuff. And that is the most shocking part is not that, you know, people missed it because you can miss fraud, but that there were so much, so many glowing endorsements like this guy is not going to be that thing. We explicitly endorse him. I saw a Fortune magazine. He was called the next Warren Buffett. It's just crazy. I think that's the problem. I actually think that's hugely a blind, like a, a blind spot of our society is we have all these heuristics that can be points of failure where like, a rule of thumb is if you go to an Ivy League, well, you must be smart, mm -hmm. right? A rule of thumb is if you're both your parents are Harvard lawyers, you must not, you must know the law. You must like kind of be sophisticated. The rule of thumb is if you're running a, a billion dollar exchange, you must be somehow somewhat ethical, right? Mm -hmm. And all of these heuristics can lead to giant blind spots where you kind of just go, oh, we'll check. Like, I don't really, it's a lot of energy to look into people. And if enough of those rules of thumb are met, we just kind of check them off and put them through the system. So, uh, yeah, it's been hugely exposing for sort of like our, our blind. Put it in there. Have you ever looked at your Google search history? Your Google search history has got to be the, some of the darkest things. Oh, <laughs> I don't think I've ever looked at my Google search history. You I'm should. pretty careful with uh, like browser hygiene and uh, stuff like that, because I think it's. Fun fact, actually, about that. No, no, no. I, I, I am. I'm, I am aware of that. Yeah. Um, I just mean for like certain sensitive topics where like I'm investigating some fraud and yes. I go sign into their website, right? Log in. Mm -hmm. I won't use like a traditional browser. I'll use a VPN and I'll like put it on like Brave or something like that. That's interesting. He could have endorsed a wide range of philosophies. And I guess you just have to wonder, are all those, would those philosophies also be tainted if um, he had gone bad? I guess effective altruism is sort of unique because he used it as part of his brand. It wasn't like he was, he described himself as a consequentialist and like that ended up mattering. It was like, he described himself as an effective altruist and he used that part of the brand to lift himself up. I guess that's why it's getting so much scrutiny. Um, I think the merits of it should speak for themselves. I mean, I don't personally, I'm not personally an effective altruist. Um, I personally am motivated by giving in part emotionally. And for some reason that I can't exactly describe, I think that's somewhat important. I don't think you should detach giving from some personal connection. I, I, I find trouble with that. And and like I said, it's for reasons I can't describe because effective altruism is sort of the most logical ivory tower position you could possibly take. It's like strip all humanity away from giving. Let's treat it like a business. And how many people can we serve through the McDonald's line of charity for like the dollar, right? Mm -hmm. um, I just personally don't resonate with that, but I don't think the entire movement is like indicted because of it. Typically, most people who care about giving and charity on the whole are nice people and are so i can't speak for the whole movement i certainly don't think sbf indicts the whole movement even though i personally don't subscribe to it yeah i mean look i kind of feel like what it teaches me and what i kind of think about when i think about systems is that no system saves you from the individual no system saves you from the individual, their intentions, their their lust for power or greed. I mean, I think one of the great ideas is the decentralization of power. And like, this is why I think democracies are so great is because they decentralize 
power across a wide range of like interests and groups and that being an effective way to kind of try as best as you can to spread out the impact of one individual because one bad individual can do a lot of harm as I mean, clearly as seen here. But um, now I don't think it has anything to do with ideology because it's not like being an effective altruist made Sam Bankman free to fraud. He was a fraud who happened to be an effective altruist. Yeah, I think, I mean, I don't have a lot of probably big brain political takes, but what I can say is that you can never get away from both the system and the individual mattering. For sure, some systems incentivize some behaviors in certain ways. But some people will take that and go, okay, all we need to do is design the perfect system and then these individuals will act completely rationally or responsibly in accordance to what our incentives say. That's not true. You could also say, all we have to do is focus on the individual and all we have to do is just create a society which raises very well-adjusted people and then we can throw them into any system with any incentives and they will act re like responsibly, ethically, morally. And I also don't think that's true. So incentives are real, but also the individual ultimately plays a large role too. So I, yeah, I don't know. I come down sort of in the middle there. <laughs> that's like a, that was like a Lex line. I've, I've heard I've I've heard quite a few episodes, and that's like such a Lex line. It's a beautiful man. Be All right, beautifully said. All right. Sorry, I'm a fan of the show. So, a yeah, I definitely think SPF should go to jail. Um, for nothing else, for a semblance of justice, the facsimile of justice to occur for all the investors. Um, I also think there are people, probably several steps down the chain that probably knew at least Caroline Ellison, you can have questions about sort of their, you know, Dan Friedberg, who I'd love to talk about as well. Um, there were a lot of people in that room who I think knew, I think we do so much of like the one guy is all to blame. Let's throw everything at him when clearly this was a company wide issue. So everyone who knew, I think should face the same punishment, which I think should be jail for all of those people. Um, in part to send a signal to anybody that tries this kind of stuff in the future. Yeah, like absolutely. Harsh, harsh I mean, one of the big things that you saw, like, okay, take a microcosm of all of this action and just look at like the influencer space, right? There's a ton of deals that were done that I've covered ad nauseum about influencer finds out they can make a lot of money selling a crypto coin. The first thing they wonder is, am I going to get caught? If I do this, is there a consequence? And if the answer is no, then it's a pretty easy decision as long as you don't like have any moral scruples about it, which apparently none of them did or a lot of them didn't, I should say. So as soon as somebody steps in and regulates, that math changes. And all of a sudden there's a self-interest reason to not go do the bad thing. So for example, and I can give a concrete example of this. There was a NFT, the first ever NFT sort of like official indictment or the DOJ released this press release that they're charging these guys who ran a NFT project that they didn't follow through on their promises. They made all these promises, lied, and then ran away with the money. First ever consequence for anyone in the NFT space. That day that that press release came out, I saw several NFT um, projects come back to life from the dead. Why? Because all those founders are freaking out. And they realized we scammed people. We have to go at least make, make it look like we're doing the right thing, right? Even just, so that's on the optic side, but there's also tons of people who now go, oh, the basically law enforcement is on the scene. We can't do the same thing. So there is a very pragmatic reason to for this punishment. It's very much just because people work it into their math of, should I commit fraud? And the last several years have been very, um, sort of has been like a little bit of a, nihilistic landscape where no one was getting punished. Mm -hmm. And so there was this question of, you're almost an idiot if you didn't take the deals. Um, so I think it's really important, extremely important for kind of law enforcement to play a role, regulation to play a role to make it harder to commit those crimes. And if you commit those crimes, there's actual real world punishment for it. To your point about like what's gonna happen to the investors, I think that was mm -hmm. kind of your question. It's tough because the, if the money's not there, the money's not there. I mean, there's going to be the guy, 
they got the best in class guy. They, it's the guy who ran the dissolving of Enron. So, I mean, I can't imagine someone better equipped to run a complicated corporate fraud like dissolution. But yeah, it's 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 tough because everyone's going to get probably, I don't know, 10 cents on the dollar, maybe less. I think um, there's a lot of thought around that. I forget if if they actually do do this. I mean, there, I know there's a lot of law about like, you can't treat creditors differently. You have to treat them all the same. Mm-hmm. So I think it'll be some kind of proportional payback. It's certainly not going to be that the guys at the top get, you know, a significant amount of mo- their money back and the rest get nothing. Unfortunately, I think there's such a small amount of assets that back this whole thing in the end. And that value is actually declining every day because it was inextricably tied to FSBF. It was like the FTT tokens, which now what are those worth? The serum tokens, that was his project or the project they made. What is that worth? Basically nothing. So, you know, it's a very, it's a hard situation. And, you know, there's a bigger ethical concern, which is FTX US, it's unclear how backed it was, but it was clearly more backed than FTX International. Do you take all that money and throw it into a big pot and give people money back? Or do you give the U.S. people back their amount of money, which is probably going to be significantly more, and leave everyone internationally out in the cold? And to add to that ethical issue, let's say you're a liquidator and you're U.S.-based. There's a tremendous question, like legal questions about, you know, how do you ethically do that? It's not, it's not clear. There's a tremendous incentive to, to just favor the U.S. people over everyone else because it's our country, America, whatever. But um, I don't know if that's necessarily fair. It's it's really hard. It's like, it's impossible. Yes. And then they're the ones, like it's always the rich and powerful who get the favorable treatment as a, like a microcosm of this funny story. So one of the big criticisms of crypto, and I think rightly so, is the irreversibility of the transaction. So if I accidentally send a transaction somewhere, it's gone, right? Yeah. So crypto.com accidentally sent a lady $10 million and now they want the money back and they're suing her. But the funny thing is, is if you are on crypto.com and you send, let's say I accidentally send you money and I come knocking on your door, Lex, I didn't mean to send you, you know, like a thousand dollars. I need my money back. Or if I go to crypto.com and I said, Hey, I sent that to the wrong person. Can you reverse it? They'll say, screw off. No way. If I go to court, they'll kill me in court. Because they're going to go, look, this is how the blockchain works. But then they do it. They do the exact same thing. They send this lady $10 million. They're suing her and they're going to win. Now it's now what's in court is not whether they get the money back. It's should she be liable for theft, I believe. So, and that's in just another case of the same rules apply differently to different people, whether you have the money to back you or not. It's a very sad thing. And that's why I think people like, you need journalists fighting for, the little person, we really need it. And it's kind of like this unfortunate thing where that's the most risky thing to do. Like legally, you should not be doing that. But um, I think it's important. To do. Yeah, I think I think they should take a huge reputational hit. I mean, I think they should be embarrassed. I think they should be ashamed of themselves. I think I think uh, it really depends deeply. on I think your credibility hit will depend on what domain you're an expert in. If you're yeah. sponsored by a robotics company and you're an expert in robotics, if sure. that company turns out to be a disaster and a fraud, then you should have looked more deeply. We're talking mostly about like I hold Tom Brady a lot less accountable than financial advisors, financial influencers, because that is their world of expertise. And you treat their rec- rec- recommendation differently proportionally to what you think their expertise is. So in some ways, I don't actually think, Tom Brady, I'm sure he reached a lot of people. I personally didn't feel at all moved by his recommendation because you know it's just money. But when you hear somebody who should be an expert in that thing endorse a product in that space, you hold that opinion to a higher standard. And when they're completely cataclysmically wrong, it's going to be a different level of of accountability. And I think rightfully so. When um, Jim Cramer was saying Bear Stearns is fine. He made that terrible call in Bear, with Bear Stearns in 2008. He was rightfully 
reamed for all of that, even though it could be considered that like, well, you know, did he have all the information? Maybe not. But he's a financial advisor. He does this for a living. If you go on and you make a big call and you turn out to be wrong and people lose tons of money, you are going to take a hit. I think rightfully so. But no, I don't think these people should go to jail or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we should be clear, like finance is sort of a special space where you're talking about people's money. You're not talking about whether someone takes a bad supplement or like a supplement that is just they're $50 out, right? I think the scale of harm and therefore responsibility escalates depending on what field you're in. Just like I wouldn't hold Tom Brady as like if he gives a bad football opinion, right? And he should have known better. That is a different scale of harm than a doctor giving bad advice, right? Like life, like he tells you a pill works and the pill kills you or something like that. There's just le- different levels of accountability depending on the field you're in and you have to be aware of it. Finance is an extreme, you have to be extremely conservative if you're going to give financial advice because you're playing with people's lives and you cannot play with them haphazardly. You cannot gamble with them. You cannot play with them on a bet because you're getting paid a lot of money. It's just the nature of the space. And so with the with the space comes the responsibility and the accountability. And I, I don't think you can get around that. Who was uh, Dan Friedberg that you mentioned? Some of these figures yeah. in the SBF realm that are interesting to you. Super interesting kind of subject because Dan Friedberg is uh, the former general counsel for Ultimate Bet. Ultimate Bet is a was a poker site where famously they got in a scandal because uh, the owner, Russ Hamilton, was cheating with a little software piece of code they called God Mode. God Mode allowed you to see the guy across from you's hand. Obviously, you can imagine you can win pretty consistently if you know exactly what your opponent has. Very unethical. uh, I should be clear that for some inexplicable reason, I don't think they were ever charged and convicted of a crime. But they were investigated by a gambling commission that found they made tens of millions of dollars this way, for sure. And Dan Friedberg is the general counsel. He's caught on a call, basically conspiring with Russ to hide this fraud. He's saying we should blame it on a cons- you know a consultant, third party. And Russ Hamilton famously says, you know, like it was me. I did it. I don't want to give the money back. Find basically a way to get rid of this. So that's Dan Friedberg's big achievement. Like that's what he's known for. He's most known for. And this is the guy they pick as their chief regulatory officer for FTX. Why do you hire somebody who, I I get it, not formally charged and convicted, investigated, there's all the, and there's tape out there. So I want to be clear about what's actually available evidence. But someone whose seemingly only achievement is hiding fraud, why do you hire that guy if the intention is not to hide, is not to hide fraud? So this is a question I put to you know, Sam Bankman fried and his answer was, well, we have a lot of lawyers. Well, and I said, well, it's your chief regulatory officer. He's like, well, it wasn't, we, we did regulate a lot. And it was just this big dance of, you know, basically he's done great work. He's a great guy. And I think that tells you everything you need to know. And there's figures like that probably even at the lower levels, like just infiltrate the entire organization. Well, it's just like, why? yeah, why wasn't there a CFA? Why Why wasn't there anyone in that space who could seemingly be the eyes that goes, holy, whatever, we need to, we, we're in dangerous territory here, right? Um, so yeah, it seems very deliberate. I mean, I talked to one FTX employee that they talked about, who's told me they talked about taking, I think it was taking FTX US public. And Sam was very against the idea. And the employee, in retrospect, speculated that it might have been because you'd face so much scrutiny, like regulation wise, like you'd have to, you know, go through a lot like more thorough audits, all that kind of stuff that basically he knew they would never pass. Um, So, yeah, I mean, it's it's red flags all the way down with that guy. And you hope all of them get punished. Everyone who knew. I mean, I think for sure there are people at FTX who didn't know. I think there are some people at Alameda who didn't know. Well, yeah, like I was talking to one insider and we were talking about the insider trading. They were telling me about this insider trading. And I said, do you think this was criminal? And they said it was probably criminal in hindsight. Yes. And the question is someone who answers a question like that 
what does that like mean? You know, like it was probably criminal. So you're right. There, there are different degrees. I mean, I'll say at the most basic, I would be very happy if everyone who had direct knowledge went to jail, which I don't think will happen to be clear. I think a lot of people are going to cut deals. Prosecutors are going to cut deals. So they actually nail Sam Bankman fried. I think that's their only focus. I think it's useful. I, I mean, I think with res- it's all it's all about how you interview him. You can interview someone responsibly. You can interview him irresponsibly. I think we've seen examples of both. What's an irresponsible? I keep interrupting you rudely. That's this okay. Is, no, no, no. It's unacceptable. No, no, no. I think it's fine. Um, there was like a New York Times interview, which spends an amount of time, any amount of time talking about his sleep. And he's like, yeah, I'm sleeping great. I mean, I think that's so deeply disrespectful to the victims. And especially when you're, you're not even releasing an interview live. It's like you have time to triage what you're going to talk about. Why would you spend any amount of time talking about the sleep that a fraudster is get, get it's just so weird and you just that's all fine but this was this conversation was not properly contextualized yes in the world of what he did it and i you know i've i've asked about this interview because i was like so curious it was out, out of the new york times and there was not much mention of fraud or jail or the, the big crimes, like misappropriation of even client assets. It was just sort of this, you know, Sam sat down with me. He's he's under investigation, but there's not much specifics. And then it's like, yeah, he's playing storybook brawl. He's sleeping. He's and it's just like, OK, this isn't oh, yeah, adding to yeah. oh, the no, no, conversation, no, 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 no. especially when the New York Times, it's like a. You should be grilling. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. So, um, but as I said, I mean, it's it's all ranged the gamut and some interviews, like some of it's okay and then some of it's weird. Like the Andrew Sorkin interview, he asked some hard hitting questions, which I really appreciated. And then at the end, he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Sam Bankman fried and everyone gives like, a, like an ovation for Sam. I mean, the steel man of that, of course, is like, they're actually applauding Andrew Sorkin. But the way you like lay it up, I wouldn't go like, ladies and gentlemen, it's like an applause line. It's like, ladies and gentlemen, the Eagles, Elton John, Lex yeah. Friedman. Yeah. And so to go to, so you have this like deal book summit where you have all these important figures that are positively important. And at the end, you have Sam Bankman Fried, a fraudster. And you go, ladies and gentlemen, Sam Bankman Fried, everyone's applauding. That I think is a net, like, I think that's a negative. I think the way that the optics of that just were all wrong. Yeah. And so I think, um, yeah, you have to be very responsible. I think it's useful going back to how you can usefully do this. You can, even when somebody's determined to lie to you, it's always important to pin them down to a, an accounting of events because that is unimaginably helpful when it comes to a prosecutor trying to prove this guy's guilty is if you say you didn't do a crime, but you don't tell me any de- details about it. Day of the trial, you can basically make up any story, right? But if you tell me in detail where you were that day, I can go hunt down. You say you were with Joe. I go hunt down Joe and he says he wasn't with you. Boom, you've lost credibility. And now you're much more you're much more um, likely to be convicted. So it's really important to get SBF's exact accounting of how things went wrong, because right now he's positioning himself to throw his uh, Alameda CEO, Caroline Ellison, under the bus. Like she did everything. She knew everything. I knew nothing. Well, is Caroline Ellison's going to take the stand and go, well, I have all these text messages and this is all a lie. And then Sam Bankman fried is going to be completely, you know, uh, ruined, like self-ruined by his own design. So I think it's so more like a me. legal type of uh, like get the details of where he was, what he was thinking, what the. I think it's like, yeah, I think it's I think the public probably cares to get to know what happened to. And, I, and again, I think if you're if you're careful, you can expose someone for as they lie to you without giving into those lies, right? Like without capitulating to, oh, I'm just going to assume you're correct. I think you can point to, well, Lex, you say it happened this way, but you've lied about X, Y, and Z. Why should we believe you? That's a suddenly a totally different conversation than just being like, oh, okay, that's how it happened. Yeah. I think, I think it'd be really hard. I mean, he, like that guy is sort of a master dancer and what he would say at the end of it, because I've listened to so many interviews of him. Um, I probably am like a GPT model for Sam. I think he would do some kind of thing about like, yeah, I really, um, 
I really um, hear you. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just terrible. I feel such an obligation to the people who've lost money. And, you know, it's just, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. You know, he'd do something like that. And it would be very superficially like, okay. But when you, gr when you drill down to the details of what he did, it's just impossible that he didn't know. And one of the things that I wish I had asked, maybe I can talk about like, I wish I had gone on this. It's just so hard when you're doing a live interview to kind of focus on one thing. Everyone's asked about the terms of service. So in the terms of service, there was like, we can't touch your funds. Your funds are safe. We're never going to do anything with that. Anytime anyone brings that up, he says, oh, well, there's this other terms of service over here with margin trading accounts. Remember, we talked about it. it's a derivatives platform. If you're in our derivative side, you have, you're subject to different terms of service, which kind of lets us like move your money around with everyone else. Okay. So we treat it as one big pool of funds. And that's sort of the explanation of how this all happened is we had this huge leverage position and we lost everything. But what no one has sort of done a good enough job getting to the heart of is that this pool of funds never was segregated properly. Mm -hmm. It was all treated under the same umbrella of we can use your funds. There was no amount of we have the client deposits, which were just deposited with us and not like used to margin trade or do anything over here. These funds over here, we have saved. They didn't. Fundamentally, they lied from the get-go about how they were treating the most precious assets, which is your customer deposits that you said you didn't invest. Clearly, you put them all over here. You YOLO gambled them. And then when everyone starts uh, withdrawing from here, they don't have any money over here. So that is like one, one of the most fundamental things that I haven't seen anyone grill him on. And uh, the next time, if I get the chance to ambush him again. That's, that's what I'm going to drill down on because it's impossible for that not to be fraud. There's no world where you had a pool of funds over here and now you don't have them without you somehow borrowing over here. Because if you deposited one Bitcoin and I never sold that Bitcoin and it's earmarked Lex Friedman and you come and it's not there, something had to happen, right? I think I've talked to so many people who have sort of committed some range of like outright fraud to like misleading marketing. No one thinks they're a bad person. Nobody mm -hmm. admits that they did it and they knew they did, or almost nobody does. There's actually one funny exception, but um, <laughs> yeah. I had a guy who admitted like, yeah, I did it. It was wrong. And, uh, you know, but I did it and I wanted the money, <laughs> which was kind of like almost refreshing in its honesty. But um the reason I focus on like the facts is because unless you find a bright red line, humans can rationalize anything. Mm -hmm. I can rationalize any level of like, well, I did this because I had the best of intentions. And if you play the intention game, you'll never convict anyone because everyone has good intentions. Everyone's honest. Everyone's doing the best they can and got misleaded and got misguided and da, 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 da. Ultimately, you have to drill down to the concrete and go, look, I get it. You're just like the last 50 guys that I interviewed. You had the best of intentions. It all went wrong. I'm very sorry for you. But at the end of the day, there's people hurting and there's people that, that have significant damage to their life because of you. What did you actually do? And what can we prove taking intention out of it, taking motivation out? What can we prove that you did that was unethical, uh, illegal, or immoral? And like that is sort of what usually I try to go to because I will do those human interviews, but... Um, you know, it's just like, it's just, a, it's like the same record on repeat. I mean. Two, yes, two things. One, I think you should join me on this side of the table. We'll put SBF over here. Yeah. Well, good guy, bad guy, human, it, facts. Like, you're the, like you're the bad guy. I'm like, no, no, no. Slow down, coffee. What is your feeling about humanity? <laughs> Yeah. I, Have you been getting enough sleep? Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, so I so I think, no, I think there's a lot of truth to what you said. One thing I've noticed that is hard to combat is sort of like preference falsification and just like, just the outright lying about those things yeah. is tough to kind of pin down. But yeah, you're absolutely right. There's ways to interview people. There's all sorts of interesting techniques. And yeah, I, I don't disagree. Yeah. So uh, SafeMoon was a crypto coin that exploded on the scene in um, 2021, I think, at this point. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm losing track of my years. One year in crypto is like five years in real life. Um, but it kind of gained a huge amount of popularity because of this idea that 
it's in the name. You go safely to the moon. How they were going to do this is with sort of a sophisticated smart contract idea where there's, I kind of have to explain the way some contracts get rug pulled for a second or there's scams happen. So in the, uh, sometimes it's called like the shit coin space, the altcoin space, anything like below Bitcoin, Ethereum, and maybe the top five or 10 is kind of seen as this wasteland of gambling. And like, you know, you don't know if they're the developers are going to become anything or not. You're kind of like reading the white paper, trying to figure it out. So there's this big question about like, how can you get scammed? How can back to the interests, you don't want the, the developer to have some like parachute cord where they can pull all the money out. So one way this happens is that in decentralized decentralized finance, there's something called the liquidity pool. Okay. It's basically this big pot of money that allows people to trade between two different currencies. So let's say like SafeMoon and Bitcoin, right? Or Ethereum, or it's actually on the Binance Smart Chain. So it'd be BNB. Um, and this pool of money can be controlled by the developers in such a way they can steal it all, right? Mm -hmm. They can just grab it. I don't want to go too much into details because I feel like I'll lose people here. But the point of SafeMoon was, the core idea was we're locking this money up. You can't touch it. And actually, every transaction that you buy SafeMoon with will take a 5% tax of that. We'll do a 10% tax, but 5% of it will go back to all the holders of SafeMoon. Okay. And 5% of it will go back into this little pool of money. Okay. So the idea is as you trade, as this token becomes more viral, two things will happen. One, the people who are holding it long term will be rewarded for holding it long term by receiving this 5% tax that's distributed to everyone. And two, you can kind of trust that your, your money's going to have this stable value because this pool of money here in the middle that's kind of guaranteeing you can get your safe moon out into this actually valuable currency. It's not going to move. So the story of SafeMoon was that fundamentally, this was not the case. Uh, they promised that this money was going to be locked up. It was not actually locked up at all. They said it was automatically locked up. You don't have to worry about it. Well, it was very manually locked up, and they didn't actually lock a lot of it up. Um, they took a lot of it for themselves, for the developers. So there's a lot of players in this. Um, some of the, A lot of them have left by now. There's kind of this main CEO that everyone knows, John Caroni now. and you know, despite saying that they were going to lock up all the funds for four years, somehow he's gone from as everyone else in the in the token has lost 99 percent of the value of the token. So they've lost 99 percent. He's gotten uh, like a six million dollar crypto portfolio, multi million dollar real estate portfolio, invested millions into various companies. So he's he's accrued this huge wealth. And so I made a video basically exposing that and showing how this this coin, which once had a $4 billion market cap, is just viral everywhere. Everyone was talking about it because of these viral ideas of like, it is sort of a captivating idea that by holding it, you could get returns, right? Yeah. Like you just hold on to it, you automatically get money. And it's a viral idea that this money in the middle in the pot isn't going to leave you. When those things turned out to be false, this community has had a slow death as a lot of people realized it was a scam. And there's been a core part of the community which gets to an interesting dynamic we can talk about if you want to, where they have like doubled down on the belief in Caroni. And so part of it was out of a hope to let those people know what was really going on in their coin and like hopefully save some of them. Um, not in like some altruistic sense, but like, or not in like some like, I'm like a hero sense, but in the sense of um, like, I think a lot of them didn't know, like literally didn't know. So just sort of like as a public service, letting them know so they could get their money out and hopefully save themselves uh, a lot of pain and suffering. So yeah, so they really dug in. So, the, so some did, some did, some okay. did, some left. I mean, a lot of people have left, but the people who are left are people with large amounts of safe moon holdings that are down immensely. And you can imagine at a certain point in losses, there's a tremendous psychological pressure to go. Look, I'm in, I'm in it. I got to go for the long haul. And then you want to believe that this thing is legitimate and will succeed because A, there's an ego component around, I haven't been scammed. I'm too smart to get scammed. It's tremendously, uh, you know, it's, it hurts psychologically to acknowledge you've been taken for a ride. And also you just want this thing to succeed for your financial well-being. So you like want to believe it. So there's tremendous psychological pressure to build 
cult-like communities around these tokens. And I've noticed with the incentive of like community built, it's sort of new to finance. There's like these meme coins or these, these cults. I don't want to, it's not really fair to call all of them cults. Like some of them are open to criticism, but one of the things that defines cults is they're not open to sunlight or criticism. There's these financial communities that are opening up with crypto, with a few stocks, where if you criticize them, you are attacked. And the entire community has every incentive to kind of like downplay your legitimate criticisms or kind of um, go after you. And so it, inter- it creates this interesting dynamic. That- so- it's kind of tough. Like no community is a monolith. So just like, it's just a spectrum of how open they are. It, there's just like, there's always this core contingent of extreme believers who will go after anyone who criticizes them. And it's just about how wide of a band that makes up of the entire token. Sure. Amazing. You should check out Space Max. I'm just going to give one more pitch for it. It's just basically like Drag a customizable, customizable configuration. Well, Emacs is already customizable, but it's a... Uh, it's pretty useful. I'm not even much of a coder, but for like certain journaling applications or like time management, like I find it really useful. So, <laughs> but anyway, wait, we're so like in, I feel like half this podcast Tree. is what it should have been. And then yeah. half of it's just us nerding out yeah, about I, our own I, I, engineering, like idiosyncrasies. Sorry, uh, <laughs> sorry guys. Uh, so, I've made certain enemies in the sort of crypto skeptics space because there's sort of this range of skepticism you can have about cryptocurrency. I'm obviously a skeptic of a lot of it, Um, but there are certain aspects of crypto that I think are inevitable, and I'm going to do my best to kind of describe those here, but I'm not committed to any crypto specifically, but there are some I've taken a lot of heat, ironically, for not being skeptical enough. There's some people who believe that like the entire thing is a complete waste of time their r slash buttcoin on Reddit. It's an amazing community, actually. It's very funny. They have- What's a buttcoin? It's like, is that, it's like a is, play on Bitcoin. They're like, oh, they're just like, oh. at least we admit it's a scam. Very funny guys. Uh, very funny people there. So, but they like, but they'll, they'll be like, you know, CoffeeZilla should just admit that all of it's a giant Ponzi scheme. All of it's a basically like not real. So everything, including Bitcoin? Inclu- yeah, it's all, it's all whole- basically all the Ponzi nomics. It's all, it's, it's Ponzi nomics all the way down. It's like, there is no fundamental use case that uh, is that useful. I don't know if, I guess I don't want to straw man them here. I don't want to say that, I don't know if they're saying that it's all useless. At minimum, they're saying the level of interest in cryptocurrencies is far, the actual usefulness of it is far less than the amount of attention and time and money that's being poured into it. So like the the revolutionariness of this technology is not at all revolutionary. Let me kind of steel man what I think the pro crypto take is. I think that technologies are sort of this inert thing. And the success of them, in my opinion, is not based on PR. It's not based on marketing. It's based on cheaper, faster, better. Fundamentally, the success of any technology relies on those three things and longevity of it. So I have two employees and both of them are out of the country. So I have to frequently make international wire payments to them. Um, Is one of them SBF just, um, as a reporter, I have to ask. No. Okay, all right, Um, he's not on the payroll. Yeah, I think he'd have to pay me. I'm trying to do my best CoffeeZilla words, like in hard hitting investigative questions. Good, good, So with these international payments, you face all sorts of, slow fees and you fa- you face like kind of like this time thing yeah. and it's this painful process so if i use different cryptocurrencies some of them are like really fast some of them have really low fees i just believe in a world where digital currencies with fast payments with cheap payments revolutionize the global exchange of currency and i don't know if this if this is going to include the blockchain, it's just that the blockchain is the first thing that's really embraced truly digital currency, which doesn't need to go through this complicated system of wire transfers and just happens. So I can send you, let's say I want to send you Ethereum or Bitcoin. 
I can send it to you just as fast if I send you a dollar or a billion dollars. And I can send it to you just as fast if you're across from me or if you're across the world from me. That I think is a step change and easier, faster, better in terms of like just this really basic international payments kind of idea. So I think at like its core, if the the lowest form use case of cryptocurrencies is that, I think it will um, change the world in some variety. It's just kind of the larger question is, is that going to, is that technology going to include the blockchain specifically or not? The other benefit is transparency, which I personally like as an investigator. It's just that previously, it's like hard to describe how opaque our financial system is until you've tried to investigate someone or something. Understanding finances, unless you have a subpoena, unless you're like the FBI or like the SEC and you can get a subpoena for someone's finances or you're going through discovery, you don't know what someone has. You're basically playing poker with everyone and the cards are face down. For the first time, the blockchain to some extent, because there are ways to obfuscate it, and in some ways, cryptocurrency has enabled more fraud, which is kind of this irony. But in some ways, it's enabled people to also audit a lot better and in real time. And I think that is a structural change that is fundamentally for the better. The question of all this is, do those betters outweigh the cons that this introduces? And how much can those can regulation mitigate those cons? Some of those cons being like fraud, money laundering, all these negative externalities that are easier with cryptocurrency. Because it's unregulated, it's the Wild West, and you can transmit large amounts of money very quickly across the world. What about- With like very little oversight. Creating new crypto projects, like uh, new coins. Uh, because you have to show very little actual use case. You can just promise. So it's like true of any emerging technology. So much vaporware happens at the beginning when it's all promise. Because fundamentally, let's say you're legitimate, I'm illegitimate. We look the same at the start of a technology Mm -hmm. because both of us are promising what this can do. And in fact, the less scruples and morals I have, in some ways I can outcompete you because I can say mine does what Lexus does, but like way better and way faster. And it's going to happen in a year rather than 10 Mm -hmm. years. You're being honest. I'm playing a dishonest game. I look better. Once this space matures and you actually have some people actually doing the things that they say they're going to do, Suddenly, this equation changes. Now, your Amazon, you're delivering in two days. I can say whatever I want. You do the thing you do, and I have no credibility. So, I think the like part of part of the fraud is, you know, just the ability to transmit so much money so quickly with such little oversight. Part of it is like this just happens with any emergent technology. Vaporware is a real thing, and hopefully, as this space matures, as regulation comes in, things will improve. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah, I do. I mean, I'm not totally oblivious to the precariousness of like any kind of journalism like this. Obviously, there's risks. I've always believed there's a quote, and I'm going to butcher it, but I hope you guys understand the spirit of it. Um, you know, news is when you print something someone else doesn't want you to print. Everything else is public relations. I really believe to do meaningful journalism, you have to go after people. Like, it's not inherently a safe profession. I mean, if you're going to do important work, you have to have risk tolerances. And I think everyone has a line of what that risk tolerance is. And it's different for everyone. I don't think I could do what Edward Snowden did. I think that would be my bright red line is going against my own government. It's such a, in my opinion, I really see him as a hero. Like it's such a selfless act of self-destruction. You know that the the party you're going after has all the power and will crush you. And you do it anyway out of the like the true, I don't know, platonic ideal of journalism. I think that's beautiful. I don't think I could do that. I think I need some ability to live and subsist in the society that I am in. And I think my bright red line would be like, if I'm forced to flee the country for my work, I think I'd finally have to say no. But for, as journalists go, I'm pretty risk- I take risk pretty well. Um, I especially like think risk is important to take when you're young and when you can do that. I think when I have, I mean, I'm married. So when I have a family, I think I will probably dial this risk thing down just 
being honest. I mean, I think you, you kind of have to. Um, but right now, I'm, I mean, I'm kind of like running on all cylinders. I'm willing to take on quite a quite a range of people. But um, well, you're yeah, also... I think a lot about it. These people are less courageous. This is the this is the dirty truth. The bigger the organization, the more conservative a lot of them are. It, it's true that sometimes they like and this is not to bash big organizations. I'm just saying this as an observation of someone who's talked to a lot of people. And especially in the world of fraud, a lot of them are scared to engage in fraud that is obvious but hasn't been litigated yet. This is why you'll never see documentaries about ongoing fraud on Netflix. It's too much of a liability. They'll sue Netflix to hell. And they know that if they win, Netflix has the money to pay it. So corporations like the New York Times, you know, a lot of these, some of them are very, like they're as courageous as they can be. But at the bottom line, if someone sues you to hell and back and you have to pay up, you will disappear. And you're relying on liability insurance, which you're already paying out the ass for, to try to cover you if you get sued. But if you get sued, even if you win, that liability insurance now goes up in price the next year. And if you're the New York Times, it goes up by a lot. So, I mean, um, I think there's work that independent journalists can do uniquely that they can actually take, like, in some ways more risk than a giant institution, which has a lot more in my sense to lose, even though it would appear like they have more in terms of defense too. But you get, uh, you can be bullied legally. Yeah. Do you get afraid of that? Sure. I mean, I just, uh, all these things are things you have to be aware of and then forget to do your job. Like you have to be, you know, it's like, it's like being like a snowboarder and it's like, do you realize you could hit your head? And it's like, yeah, of course. But in order to go do the, like the flip or whatever, you have to just accept the risk, mitigate the risk as much as possible and move on. So we have, um, we have like insurance. We keep like a pool of funds for that kind of thing. Like I'm, I'm very conservative with how I, I spend my money basically all on, production and like trying to make my life as secure as I can. And then I just do the work that I, you know, I, I want to do because. I think there was a time when I was getting a lot of cease and desists. Some people were like, actually like, like saying like, they're going to show up to my house, all that kind of stuff. I don't think I was that. Um, I think I was pretty worried about that for a while. My wife was huge source of strength here where she was like, Hey, if you're not comfortable with it, you need to get out of the game or you need to basically like suck it up. And like, this is what it is. If you're going to go after these people, you have to basically, um, be mentally strong around this and seeing her have that realization helped me have the same realization. And I really deeply admire and respect that about her. And it, solved a lot of my concerns around that. It's just, it just made me realize every profession has risks. It is what it is. You mitigate and then you move on. That's such an enormous compliment and probably overstatement. But um, I first want to pay respect. There are a lot of great journalists and a lot of them are like, I don't want to just kind of take it and go, yeah, you know, it's just me. There's so many great journalists. M Matt Levine, Kelsey Piper, um, you know, you've got anonymous journalists like Dirty Bubble. You've got citizen journalists like Tiffany Fong. But, so, who, uh, but, yeah. mm -hmm. but I think if you're going to be in the space in the long term, you do need to accept certain risks. And I think in the long term, it's like, I don't know how easy it is to play that game for a long period of time because you make, to do great journalism, you don't get paid a lot compared to what you could get paid if you did press pieces or anything like that. You take a lot of risks legally. You take physical risks. You take, it's just like, if you care about money, it's not the profession. And I feel like, a lot of people, when they get notoriety, they move to like, well, I can just maximize the money security side of things. And I think it takes out a lot of would-be great journalists. I'll say, I want to make a call. Like, I think societies can 
create better journalists and worse journalists insofar as they support the journalists who are doing great work. And I want to call out Edward Snowden specifically because what we have done to him is such a travesty. And the only lesson you can learn if you're a logical human being is that you should never whistleblow on the United States government after looking at what they did to Snowden. So as a society, we can put pressure on lawmakers to make it easier for people to do the great work by not punishing the people who do great work, if that makes sense, and de-risking it for them. Because we shouldn't expect journalists to be martyrs to do great work, right? To do important work. And part of that comes from protecting whistleblowers. There's like very common sense things. I love like, it's great to heroicize, you know, people like Edward Snowden and stuff like that, but we shouldn't expect them to be heroes to do that work. Government, politics. government, politics, politics. It seems to me you can't do good work. Um, like everybody doing good work in politics is to some extent from my limited perspective, as I, as I said, I'm not that into it. It seems like everyone has to take a side because even if you do great work, whoever you're exposing, half the other people, no matter how good your work is, are going to claim it's just for partisan hackery and they're going to malign you. So it seems like a lot of journalists have to take a slant, even if it's not explicit like bias, mm -hmm. they have to take a slant on who they expose. I hate that. I would really like a world where you could freely expose both sides without having a constant malignment of like, you know, or who are you working for? Or you did this for X, Y, Z or whatever. Like, I really find that deeply problematic about our current, uh, like journalism in the political sphere. As far as government stuff, I think it's easy to do, not easy, but like, it's much more enticing to do foreign journalism than to do local journalism on positions of power. Because if you question, it's so easy to just get the bigger you, the bigger cases you expose locally, you're you get in danger. Like it's just like very very clear cut. The bigger the case, the more your your financial well being, your access, your entire life is like sort of in jeopardy. Whereas if you do foreign journalism, you can do great work, and largely you're protected by your own government. So it's kind of this weird thing where if you want great journalism on America, sometimes going abroad might be. <laughs> well and i think also like there's a criticism of all centrists which i think in some way is fair and i say that as someone largely who's a centrist which is that this what about is or like this like what about the left or what about the right can skew when it's not a one it's not a both sides issue so in the case of like russia ukraine i think like i'm strongly in favor of ukraine even though I tend to go like on both sides. And that might be partly because one of my employees is Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what a great journalist does, especially like in politics, is I think they criticize the regime that's most in power, most controls the keys, and is the most corrupt at that time. And they might appear to be like, let's say during the realm of Trump, a great journalist would criticize Trump. But that same journalist who held Trump's feet to the fire should be capable of holding Biden's feet to the mm -hmm. fire four years later, mm -hmm. if that kind of makes sense. That's oh, it's it, like, it, that's an exact case of like, China has made it so difficult to be a good journalist that they've effectively squashed criticism because to be a journalist in China means constantly risking your life every single day to criticize that government. And so the best journalists are a lot of times outside the country um, or they have sources inside the country who are like, there's like this, you know, different, there's layers to the journalism where there's insiders who are leaking information, but they themselves cannot publish because it's like, it's, you know, it's, it's extremely risky. So yeah, I think, I think as a society, one measure of how healthy the political structure is is how well you can criticize it without fearing for your safety. Very harsh. And be, in terms of safety, are pretty safe. Yes, absolutely. I think our only challenge is like, 
where it gets dangerous is around like top secret information. The government comes down so hard that the danger in, in covering politics here is you can expose something that's top secret that should be exposed and they'll ruin you. Kind of always been interested in fraud or or at least I saw fraud early on and I was just like curious about what is this? I didn't know what I was really looking at. So basically my mom got cancer when I was in high school and it was pretty traumatic. I mean, she's fine. She had thyroid cancer, which is, I, we didn't know it at the time. It's like cancer's cancer, but it's fairly easily treatable with surgery. Uh, it's one of the better, you know, survivable ones. And I just watched her get like bombarded with all these like phony health scams of, you know, just like colloidal silver, you know, all these different like remedies. And she was very into, you know, all the different ways that she might treat her cancer. And obviously surgery is very daunting. And, you know, I was just confused. I was like, why are we doing so many different remedies that all seem of very dubious health value? Later, I'd find out that these are like all grifters. I mean, they, they take advantage of free speech in America to like advertise their products as, you know, life-saving miracles, whatever, when they're of course not. Um, eventually she got the surgery, thank God. But I know people in my life who their parents passed away because, because they didn't have the surgery. They instead took the alternative option. I know like, I don't want to go into specifics cause I don't want to mention their specific like case, but their, uh, family member went to Mexico for some alternate treatment, health treatment, instead of getting an easy surgery and they died. And so it's like, I realized, you know, where is the outrage about this? Where's the, who covers this stuff? And I realized, well, not many people do. Then I went to college. I was getting a chemical engineering degree and all my friends were like telling me, you know, hey, you should come to this meeting. You know, we don't need this. Like you're doing this engineering stuff. That's great. You're going to make like 70K a year, but don't you want to get like rich now? Like why wait till you're 60 years old to retire? Like you can be rich now, Lex. So I'd go show up to a hotel and there'd be an MLM, like multi-level marketing, you know, pitch for, uh, Amway or whatever it was that day. And I was once again, fascinated. I didn't know what I was looking at, but I was like, what is this weird game we're all playing where we sit in this room? We're looking at the speaker who says he's so successful, right? But why is he taking a Friday or a Saturday to do this, you know, pitch at night? And they're going to telling me I'm going to be financially free, but they're working on their Saturday and Sunday. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, how financially free are they? So I was just like confused. I was like, you know, none of my friends were rich. They all said they were going to be rich. No one ever seemed to get rich. And so I was sort of baffled by what I was looking at. Later, I graduate. I had no interest in doing engineering, which we can kind of get into, but I wanted to do something in media. Um, and I started covering a variety of topics, but eventually I sort of revisited this interest in fraud and I started talking about these kind of get rich quick grifters that were online sort of the, the Ty Lopez variety, you know, 67 steps or, you know, whatever, like five steps to get rich, five coins to 5 million, you know, these get rich quick schemes that a lot of people were interested in. No one seemed to get rich once again, except for the people at the tippity tippity top selling the get rich quick thing. And I was like fascinated by the structure of it. And I was like, does nobody see what this is? Like, does nobody get it? So I started making a series of videos on that. And the response was like palpable. I mean, it was like, I've made a lot of stuff before that. I had made stuff that got a million views. I'd had like some marginal success, but the response of like the emails that came in, the, I could tell this work, even though it had far less views at the time was having a different level of impact. And that's what I was really interested in. One of my problems with engineering was from my standpoint, I did chemical engineering at Texas A&M. And like, I was like, is my future just going to be in a chemical plant, improving some process by 2%. And that's like my gift to the world. Like I just, I didn't see the hard impact and that maybe that's a lack of imagination because chemicals matter, but I needed, I wanted to see an impact in the world. And so when like I did started doing this fraud stuff, exposing fraud, I like clicked in my brain. I was like, whoa, this is kind of doing what I want to do. And so I started posting videos. At first it really focused on like get rich, quick scheme, grifty advertising, which I think is super predatory and we can go into why, but, um, it eventually graduated to crypto and it snowballed, I guess, because now we're talking to Sam Bankman Freed. <music> Grifters play on this though, right? Like this is, so the best salesmen play on true narratives 
that you already believe. So the true narrative is, you know, life is unfair. It is tough. Um, the American dream as described by go to a job, work at the same company for 40 years and then retire to a safety net that your positive is going to be there. That is largely dead. And so they like play on those fears and those problems to then sell you a pill, a solution, a thing. And this, the problem is, is, that, is that the solution is usually worse than even the problem they sketched out. Like you will do better most of the time by going with the regular company than you will by going with these goofy multi-level marketing. But let me answer your question. What is a multi-level marketing? So there's a criticism, first of all, that, um, well, let me get to what it is in theory. Like at its most ideal, multi-level marketing is where you have a product that you're selling. And one of the ways you help sell it is by rather than going through traditional marketing, like where you go and you put out print advertising, it's like sort of a social network of marketing. I sell to you. And then actually, Lex, not only can I sell to you, you can then go sell this product and you'll make money selling it. And you know what? To incentivize me to get other salesmen, because when I get another salesman, I'm actually giving myself competition. So that's bad. So to incentivize me to do that, they'll pay me part of what you make, right? And then you go out and you go, okay, well, I can sell this product. I also can get new salesmen to like sell for me and I'm going to make money from you, whatever. So it goes down the line of you create multiple levels where you can profit from their marketing, right? The problem with this system is that however well-intentioned it is, is that usually the emphasis of that selling and making money ends up not being about the product at all and ends up entirely being about recruiting new people to recruit new people to recruit new people. That's the real way to make money in multi-level marketing. This is where the very true criticism of most multi-level marketing, if not all, are pyramid schemes in structure because what a pyramid scheme is, is it's all about I put in $500 and I recruit two people to put in $500 and that comes up to me and they put in two, they get two people to put in $500 and it goes to them. And the reason it's a, it's a flawed business model is in order for it to work and everyone to make money, you'd have to assume an infinite human race. Mm -hmm. And so that's not the case. Most people end up getting screwed in multi-level marketing and in pyramid schemes. That's what that is. That's that thing. And the quality of the product, it doesn't necessarily matter what you're selling. To people who are financially incentivized to like buy this thing. Yeah, and so you're um, you're selling the dream of becoming rich yes. to the people down in the pyramid. That's the real product of multi-level marketing, unfortunately. Um, and so you look at the statistics of these companies, and although they'll make it seem like it's so easy to be the top, you know, 0.1% who's making all this money, the statistics are that 97% make less than a minimum wage doing this. They spend an enormous amount of time. And just what's so cruel about it is that's not advertised up front. I mean, it's like, if I go at work at McDonald's, I know what I'm getting. Mm -hmm. If I go work at Amway, I have visions of, they've sold me visions of beaches and whatever. And more than likely I'm losing money. So better than 50% of people lose money, but 97% of people make less than minimum wage. So it's like, it's such a bad business uh, for the vast majority of people who join it. And the people at the very top who are lying to the people at the bottom saying they all can do it when they can't are making all the money. So it's, it's yeah, it's really messed up. Yeah. Yes, I, okay. I, I, something with a but, V was what I was gonna say. It might uh, be Vector. Um, yeah, but, I, I get but, what you're saying though. It's but, a multi-level marketing knife selling. Well, this is one of the problems with fraud is there's a tremendous embarrassment to being had. Yeah. Also, if you buy, so slightly different human nature is that if you buy into a get rich quick scheme and then it doesn't deliver, you're more likely to blame yourself than blame the product yeah. for not actually working. You go, well, yeah. there must be something flawed with me. That's true. And they yes, constantly exactly. reinforce this. They go, well, it's all about your hard work. The system works. Look at me. I did it. So if you're failing, it must be some indictment of your character and you have to always double down. You have to double, the system can't be flawed. You must be flawed. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really messed up system. It really preys on people's psychology to to keep them in this loop. And that's why in some ways these things are so viral, even though they don't actually get most people a significant amount of wealth and they cost most people money. So it's very most, unfortunate. Most people do have the dream of becoming rich. Most young people. Right. And the thing is, is that everyone knows in business, what do you sell? You sell solutions to problems. So if so many young people want to get rich, the product is that pitch. It's you sell them the dream. Yeah. Why this gets so grifty and so cruel and predatory 
is because there is no easy solution to this. There is no solution that people are going to buy um, because the real solution people want is no work, no education, no skills required, no money up front. And people will pay any price for that magic pill and people are happy to sell that magic pill. And I think those people are very cruel and I, I think deserve to get exposed for it. So, yeah, I, I definitely think so. I mean, that's the main reason I criticized him. Um, so let's back up. There's a few clarifications I need to make. Mm -hmm. What Andrew Tate is selling is not multi-level marketing, although he is selling the dream. He's selling an affiliate marketing thing, which is slightly different. Mm -hmm. So in multi-level marketing, if I sell to you and then you go sell to two other people, I make money from those two other people down the chain, multi-level. Affiliate marketing is sort of like one level. I only make money. So Andrew Tate had this affiliate program where if you sold Hustlers University to somebody else, which sounds like something people would, boomers would put on Facebook in like 2010. Like I went to Hustlers University, yeah. um, school of hard By knows. the way, you were a member of Hustlers University. So yeah, I joined, I joined, I became a hustler. That's that's in large part due to my, why I'm so successful is because of my Hustler University membership. I'm just kidding. Um, but so it's an affiliate program. So you'd sell, like I sell to you this $50 course and I make like $5 and Andrew Tate in perpetuity makes $50 a month off of you. Mm -hmm. Okay. What does this course actually sell, right? Because ultimately he's selling the dream. He's selling, hey, the matrix has enslaved you. He's really gone down this like neo rabbit hole. Um, so the matrix has enslaved you. Your life is controlled by these people who want to keep you like kind of weak, you know, lazy, whatever. You need to break out and you need to achieve the, the new dream, which is sort of like hustling your way to the top. You don't need the antiquated systems of, of school. You can just pay me $50 a month and I will teach you everything. Okay. So what do you actually get? Well, and why is it a scam? So you actually, I think it's just a scam in terms of like value and like you're selling based on these completely unrealistic things. He's like, let's get rich. Okay. You get a series of discord rooms. So you, do you know what discord, most people know what discord is. It's like a bunch of, you know, chat rooms basically. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like AOL or is it like- Yeah, 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 right, right. Well, I'm talking to the guy who who uh, quit Emacs, so I don't know. <laughs> there's Discord servers. And in these, like, there's like there's like seven uh, different rooms you can go in, or there's several rooms, and each one is like a different field of making money. Yes. E-commerce, trading, cryptocurrency, um, I think fulfillment by Amazon, like copywriting. Okay. So I went to all of these. I checked them out. I checked all, all their money-making tools. The first funny thing is that Andrew Tate is nowhere to be found. The supposed successful guy that you like bought into is nowhere to be found. It's these professors that you have now, he has hired and said, these guys are super qualified. So like looked up some of what the, some of these guys have done. And some of them have launched like scammy crypto coins. The cryptocurrency professor was like shilling a bunch of coins that did bad and then like deleted the tweets. I mean, just completely exactly what you'd expect behind the paywall. It's nothing of substance. You're not going to learn to get rich by escaping the matrix and going to work for Jeff Bezos. Mm -hmm. Fulfillment by Amazon is not escaping the matrix, right? Like that's not the way to hustle to the top. It's literally a field of making money that everyone in the world has access to. If you want to differentiate yourself and make money, the first thing you realize is going into skill sets that literally anyone with an internet account can do is a bad way to do that because mm -hmm. you have to have some differentiating factor to add value. So it's just such a obvious and complete scam because there is no value to this like so-called education. The professors are crap. The advice, they're like hiding some of the bad things they've done. And Andrew Tate's nowhere to be found. Ultimately, that's why everyone joins. What he's done is very interesting because, and I'll give him credit in his marketing, he's been very savvy to like make the reasons you admire him, not the thing he's sort of selling, which is weird. Mm -hmm. Like he's selling get rich quick, which seems like it relates to his persona, but is actually very orthogonal to it. His persona is like the tell it how it is, like tall, buff, rich guy. Mm -hmm. It's like actually his persona that you're buying into. And then he's selling you this thing to the side, which when people get in there and they're not delivered on the product, he still is those things that you first thought he was. So it's like, I think it's to some extent, he's made a lot of money by making the thing that he makes money on, not the thing he gets 
so much pushback online for and what he's also loved for. Mm -hmm. So people will push back for his misogyny, but the real way he's making money is just like basic get rich quick schemes that are super obvious to spot, but everyone's distracted by like, oh, he said some crazy stuff about women or, you know, all these various other scandals he's gotten himself in. I think they've rebranded it. I'm part of their uh, pitch now. I'm like, they put me on as like, I mean, as like the matrix is trying to take us out, Lex. And then it's me saying like, you know, they put me in like saying I'm part of the matrix. They put me in oh, saying, oh, this guy sucks. You know, I joined, it sucks. And so they'll play that and they do like a bass drop and it's like, you know, don't listen to people like this. Da, 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 da. I mean, it's, I'm basically like, a, oh, so you've been co-opted by the matrix to attack. Yes. You're an insider threat that infiltrated right. and now is being used by the matrix to attack him. Well, uh, to everyone I mean, who criticizes him as part of the matrix, he won't say who the matrix is. It's just, it's just the shadowy cabal of rich, powerful people. It's just like the easy narrative for people who are disaffected and who feel cheated by the system. You just collectivize that system and you make it the bad guy and you go, look, look, those guys, those guys who have been cheating you, they're the bad guys. They want me shut up. And then now the person that the, the people who harmed you, they want this guy shut up. You're going to listen to him. So that's like, it's like the ba most basic psychological manipulation that everyone seems to constantly fall for. It's, it's really a trivial and stupid, but. As much as it pains me, I will try to give a, uh, a succinct, maybe steel man of it as best as I can, thinking that it's such a grift. But um, I think what you would say is that some people, in order to make a change in their life, need a someone who they can look up to. And men don't have a lot of like strong role models, like big male presences in their life who can serve as a proper example. So the most charitable interpretation would be Andrew Tate, would encourage you to go reach for the stars, I guess. My problem is I have a deep, like, I have a deep issue with the, like, lust and greed that centers all these things. It's like this glorification of wealth equals status, wealth equals good person, wealth and Bugatti equals you are meaningful, you matter. And, like, the dark underlying thing is that none of that, none of that matters. Like none, it matters that you make a decent living, but past just like that, I think the like lust for more stuff and the idolization of these people that is just like opulence is a net bad. So that's like, I, my steel man has to stop there because yeah. I really disagree with like the values that are pushed by people like that. problem is though is the people who are pitching unrealistic versions of that are getting a lot of attention whereas like there's so many great free courses where you can learn everything and more about fulfillment by amazon or about copywriting or all these different things that i think like so often the air is just the oxygen is sucked up by all the grifters who promise everything it's back to what we said about vaporware this is one of the reasons that um, like educational products can so often be co-opted by grifters is vaporware is very hard to distinguish because prompt like the feedback loop on education is not clear. It's not obvious immediately. So I can sell you a book and I can say this is going to change your life if you apply it. If you don't, ch if your life doesn't change, I just say, well, you didn't apply it, right? Like it's, it's, there's this weird relationship. It's not clear the value. It's not so easy to like quantify education. So that gets co-opted by people who make yeah. all the promises. They get a ton of attention, a ton of money. And then those people are often left, left confused and like kind of disillusioned, maybe thinking, well, this didn't work in one year, so it's not going to work at all. Yeah. Um, and so I think, yeah, there there are problems there. There's certainly a need for like male role models. There's certainly a need for somebody kind of to speak to a younger generation. I just think that person shouldn't, shouldn't be maybe Andrew Tate, like personally. Yeah. God believe, this kid. believes in you. I sure. believe in you. Sure. Yeah. It, yeah, it does. I mean, 
I think so. I think dreaming is actually really important. I'm more protective over people co-opt those dreams for money. Yes, yes. yes and like, absolutely. I do think it matters so much that we encourage people to take risks. It's one of the great things about America is it lionizes like sort of people who have taken risks and won. But I think it's just a weird, vapid thing when like the reason you do all of it is for this thing you can get out yes. at the end of the day. When we all know, and you like you've just heard a million interviews, like nobody ever is gets the Bugatti and goes, this now completely fulfills me. Everyone knows the the beauty and the like fulfillment actually comes from becoming obsessed about what you're doing for its own sake, sort of the journey, the beauty of that thing. Um, and I think money's just this thing we have to deal with to be able to do cool stuff. Like I acknowledge that, you know, you need money to build the $10 million studio to like, you got to get the cameras, you got to get the lights. And I'm very blessed to be able to have gotten that. Mm -hmm. But past a certain point, like I think that is really the function of money is to just do cool stuff. But ultimately, if you can't fall in love with the process and like the craft itself, you will be left very unhappy at the end of it. And so to start people off on that journey by pointing to the shiny object and going like, that's what you should care about seems to me so backwards. We should learn from the actual people who have done it and said, that shiny thing did nothing for me. Learn to love the journey. And like, that's the thing we pitch people yeah. as unsexy as that might be. Yeah. And there's just a tremendous, like funny thing where you can't become great without having a willful denial of the statistics. Like in some ways you have to take the chance, even if that chance is so improbable and you, it's always those people who did take that chance who end up winning. So I agree. Sure. So Save the Kids was a charity coin that was launched by a number of extremely popular influencers. I think they had over 50 million followers together. Huge names. And they basically said, hey, guys, invest in this coin. We're going to save the kids. A portion of the proceeds go to charity. And this coin it's unruggable. So rugging is the term for, remember earlier we talked about safe moon, you just grab the pool of funds in the middle and you take them out. Okay. It's unruggable because we have this smart code that is going to prevent people who are quote whales, which is a crypto term for saying you have a large portion of the tokens. It'll prevent those people from selling a large amount of that at one time, right? And so basically you don't have to worry about trusting us. It just is what it is join and we will, you know, change the world, save the kids, whatever. The, ch the It was really skeezy from the beginning and sketchy because their logo matched the Save the Children logo, which is like an actual charity that, you know, so they basically copied it and said, we're saving the kids, um, like a knockoff brand. And almost immediately the, the project rugged, the, they stole the money. And tracing back through, the code was does changed at the last second before launch. Like if you looked at their code that they launched as a test versus the code they launched in actuality, they changed only like two lines and it was the whale code to basically make the whale code non-existent. Like you can sell as much as you want, as fast as you want. Um, and it turned out that some of the influencers had not only sold that and made money, but also had a pattern of pump and dumping tokens. So we can talk about what that is. Like, Yeah, what's pump and dump? A pump and dump is just where, you know, you have a huge following, you promote your little Lex coin to everybody while holding a big portion of it. And as everyone rushes in to buy it, the price is going to pump and you dump at the same time. So that's where the name comes from, pump and dump. You pump the price, sell all your tokens, make a lot of money. So I traced basically their wallets on the blockchain and found that two of the actors specifically had had a long history of doing this. Um which really proved malicious intent. And why I called it the worst is not, it certainly wasn't the worst in terms of like the amount of people affected. It uh, relatively was like a small pump and dump because it rugged almost immediately. But in terms of the amount of people that were involved in it, in terms of the amount of malicious behavior before it that like sort of proved that this wasn't an accident, the fact that there was like this whale code, it was one of the most cynical attempts to just take the money of the followers you had and just like 
that's mine now. So that's that's why I, I called it that. But that's Save the Kids. So that was uh... that was a lot of the Phase members, and uh, it was I think Addison Ray. There were a lot of people who seemed like they were kind of taking shrapnel on it. There was like this guy Tico who he didn't even sell the tokens. He just like held on to it the entire time and lost like a few thousand dollars or maybe even I forget the exact amount. He lost a lot of money, a decent amount. And so like he took a lot of shrapnel with that, but there were also people who were maliciously doing this. So in that investigation, like several of the members of FaZe got kicked out. One of them got like permanently banned. And then this other guy that I talked about fled the country. Like he sold all his belongings and like fled the country <laughs> and, you know, hid out in, in London or wherever he is now. I don't really know where he is. Somewhere in the UK area. Right. The, the most high profile ones, like just by nature, they tend to be made high profile by the influencer. So ah, sometimes so they are, but you're right. A lot of money has been lost and like nobody finds out because there's no one big sort of attached to it. They just steal a lot of money. But um, influencers are great salespeople because like in order to overcome the resistance of getting you to buy some random coin, there has to be a reason. And so much of the 21st century content creator generation is defined by these strange parasocial relationships where people feel like they know you, mm -hmm. not the character you play, but you, and you have some friendship with them. When in actuality, you don't know the viewers. You know, you have a sense, but you don't actually know all of these people. And so that relationship is extremely powerful in terms of persuasion. Yeah. So you can say, I believe in this. And I've watched you year for years. And all of a sudden I say, Lex, if Lex believes in it, I believe in it. I trust him as a human. And so that differentiates these coins. And all of a sudden the coin blows up, gets really popular. Yeah. You made this side deal and you make a ton of money. So like frustrating is, these people, Disgusting about I it. have a general sense of what they were like, sort of what I'm, I'm, I'm in the, even though I wouldn't describe myself as an influencer, I make content on YouTube. I know that, especially since they were taking these huge corporate sponsorships, they were making tons of money. They didn't have need for these scams. I mean, I think it's one thing to scam if you're like broke on the street, you know, and you're playing three card Monty That's to cool. like live. And I think it's a whole other ethically cruel thing to do if you're basically trying to upgrade your penthouse to the building next door and like you're already well off and you just kind of want to get even further ahead. I think that's where it. I wanted to say like on this kind of we're on this topic of opportunities you get, you know, kind of when you get a platform. So one of the reasons kind of I railed a little bit earlier against um, materialism or whatever, I think to the extent to which you can moderate your own greed you can play longer term games. And I think so many people end up cutting an otherwise promising career short by just wanting it too fast. Mm -hmm. So I think it's like a huge edge, just like discipline is in terms of like achieving what you want. I think I'm like a very moderate, like being comfortable with a moderate existence and finding happiness in that is a huge edge because really your overhead is so much cheaper than the people who need a Ferrari or a super nice house to feel fulfilled. Yes. And when your overhead is less, you have the luxury to say no to like yes. sketchy offers. To the different, you have freedom that other people don't have because a lot of times people don't pitch it this way. They pitch a Ferrari as freedom or like a ha big house is like you've made it. In a lot of ways, those shackle you back to right. like, you got to find the cash flow for those things. It's never a free ride. Can, can I ask you about that? Because yeah. I'm always interested in this. Um, I completely agree. I think it's funny because when you abstract yourself out to the people you admire and respect who inspired you to do the creative work you do, you never think about like the views they were getting or the money they were making or the influence they had. All you ever think about is the work itself. Mm -hmm. And it's funny when a lot of people get in this position, your temptation is to focus on that, which you can measure, which is like all the stuff you said, like the likes, the view, the, that's not actually the target or what you got into it for. If you get into it for like, cause you're inspired or whatever, your goal is inspiration, it's impact. And like that can't be quantified that same way. So it's interesting. You have to find a way as a creator of any of this stuff 
to like deliberately detach yourself from the measurable mm-hmm. and focus on this thing, which is kind of abstract. And I was wondering if you have any like ideas for that. That's really funny. That, I, no, what's funny is I <laughs> for have me because it's useful for other people's right? content. Oh my gosh, that's for, I'm going to need to borrow this. That was my problem. I <laughs> yeah. actually have some Chrome extensions for like, I don't like going down like recommendation rabbit holes when I'm at work. Mm-hmm. I just want to like search for a video, find it. I don't want to see like all the up next because I'll waste time. So I use Chrome extensions for that. But the views is a problem because it's relevant to me as a creator. Like, is this a big video? Is it a... Yeah, because I, I yeah, totally I'll have... I've, awesome. I've hated this for like a long time. YouTube made a change and they just continue to make the analytics front and center, which makes sense from their perspective. They're trying to give people better data on what is successful and what makes something successful. They're trying to train their creators. But in the process, it can lead to some unhealthy habits of thinking views define a video. And so I've long thought, okay, I've learned analytics. I understand retention. Now I sort of want to do like the Zen, like forget it all. Mm -hmm. And you can only do that if it's out of your sight. It is strange. There's like this weird hypnotism that happens once you get past a certain number. And that number is some approximation. It's like, it's always like hard numbers. It's like 100,000, a million, 10 million. People just see a number and they just go like, wow, that is, and they assign a quality to it that may not, like it usually means nothing at all. So I agree. I've never, I've never been good at like handling that. Cause you're like, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, okay. Yeah. He's sort of, it's interesting. He's like, gosh, we're getting way too in the weeds. Am I? Is this a bet? I don't know. I'm like yeah. constantly self monitoring about like what topics we went on. But if we can, Mr. Beast is so interesting because he's almost done what. Have you ever seen Moneyball? Uh, yes. It's the story of how someone brought statistics to baseball, to baseball yeah. and it revolutionized everything. He's Moneyballed YouTube. Yeah. He took statistics to YouTube and it changed everything. And everybody now, so many people are playing catch up. I think it would be interesting in a few years to see how he develops. And w- now that he's like kind of revolutionized like the data side of things, how he then approaches future videos, mm-hmm. because there's a point at which you've optimized, you've optimized, you've optimized, but optimizing for short-term video performance is not the same as optimizing for long-term viewer happiness. Yeah. And how do you do that? Assuming the YouTube algorithm does not perfectly already do it for you, which it doesn't, but they're trying to obviously do that, optimize for long-term happiness, but... But but you can't, so the one mistake to make is to and map Jimmy's philosophy onto every genre because not every genre fits sure. that model. Your model is not an idea-centric model. It's a people-centric model. And so you, like, if you were in the business of creating just mass entertainment for the sake of mass entertainment, you might focus on, okay, the reason going idea focused instead of person focused is so such a revolutionary idea in some senses is because ideas can be broader more broadly appealing than any single human can be mm-hmm. but you're not going for that you're going for a podcast interview and i think for you the goal should always be how deep can you get with interesting guests and like finding the most interesting guest which is a different probably but this- set of skills <laughs> Yeah, you need like sort of like a a pre-filter, you're the final filter. Because your problem is you're only able to think of humans that you've thought of before or been exposed to. And most of the world you've never been exposed to. So you need people to like pre-filter and go, okay, these guys are just interesting humans. Lex has never heard of them. And then you sort of take a batch of like a hundred people and you go, who seems the most interesting for me? Yeah. So Dan Locke is sort of, he's gone through a number of iterations, but he was kind of this like sales trainer guy who really made a hard push into what he called high ticket sales. And he was telling people that they could kind of escape the the nine to five rat race if they just learn high ticket sales and they can have the life of their dreams. Basically, it's like, I'll teach you to sell, but I'll teach you to ask 
like not only will I teach you to sell sell you that pen, but I'll teach you to sell it for fifty thousand dollars instead of a dollar, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I talked to a lot of the people who had taken this course because it was pretty expensive. I think it was like twenty five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars. And and mind you, the people who are taking it are like teachers and like people who don't have a lot of money. And then you take the course, and immediately you find out, okay, well, there's an upsell at the end of the course. You're not ready. You need to go from like high ticket closer, which is one of the products to inner circle or like the level up, right? And all of these courses are structured like this. So they spend a tremendous amount on Google ads to get people in the door, promising the dream. And then once you're in, you're actually not done being like the product. You're actually in the system that tries to upsell you again and again and again and again. And eventually you're paying monthly and you're getting more and more. You're constantly paying for access to Dan Locke's wisdom and like ideas. And fundamentally, this sales system wasn't working for people. I mean, I talked to like, for example, a teacher who put in like $25,000, was in debt at one point and has nothing to show for it. I know. And it was sort of these tactics of pressuring, pressuring, pressuring. And then anytime anyone would complain, he would try to silence them. So yeah. I heard from like, um, funny enough, this lady was a teacher as well. She put together a Facebook group basically saying, I think this guy's a scam. His course didn't work. It's not working for a lot of people because fundamentally the promise of turning someone from a non-salesman into a person who's making six figures selling is not an easy thing to do. It's not just a matter of just like take my course. But anyways, it wasn't working. She created a Facebook group about it and he like sues her or, and was like legally pressuring her to stop doing that. Um, and I realized like somebody has to speak out about this and everyone who is, is getting silenced. So I was like, I'm going to use my platform to raise awareness to this. And people came out of the woodwork. I mean, saying that this guy defrauded me or he scammed me. And I want to just really quickly t take a second, take a beat to explain why get rich quick schemes are different than let's say selling a water bottle and saying it's the greatest water bottle ever, mm -hmm. right? Because sometimes people wonder, they go like, well, doesn't like Nissan say their car is going to make you happy and then it doesn't make you happy? Like, why is that different from the kind of advertising of a get rich quick course? I mean, both of them are sort of promising things that aren't true, mm -hmm. but you get something, you take some kind of a training, you know, isn't it the same thing? No, here's why. There's this concept in economics called elastic demand and inelastic demand. What it essentially means is that if I raise the value of this water bottle, there's a point at which you're just going to be like, no, it doesn't make any sense, right? But there are areas in our lives where we have desperation around them that can get deeply predatory very quickly because they have no, there's no elasticity around their demand. For example, your health. If you get cancer and I have the pill that will solve it, or at least let's say I don't, I have a sugar pill here, but if I can convince you that this pill will solve your cancer or treat your cancer, you will pay any amount of money you have on this earth to get this pill. That, it, But obviously that gets really predatory really quick because selling something that isn't real is almost as compelling as selling something that is real, right? So- this happens in the get rich quick space too. There's any amount of money you would pay to make a lot more money, right? So these products have inelastic demand. That's why you see what is essentially a few webinars getting sold for $2,500. Courses that literally have identical videos on YouTube, like very similar course curriculums that are selling for such extravagant amounts of money. And I think there can be comparisons made to college because obviously there's similar like questions about benefits. But in this case, there's not even statistics available that even shows the average person gets something out of it. Yeah. That's true of like, if you go to college, your average income will improve, right? That's the justification there. There's none of that. There's no case studies. There's nothing backing their extravagant claims of you're going to make all this money. You're going to make all this wealth. Instead, they're just, as we said before, they're selling you a dream. So that's why I find all those like types of get rich quick schemes so problematic. And uh, that's why I've railed against them for significant amount of time. Great question. So I think one of them is that there's this systemic problem that the the phrase, there's a sucker born every minute is very true. 
there is no end to the people who will fall for something like this. And the problem is, is because there's just no end to need and want and like, and just lack. I mean, it's easy to, on the one hand, criticize people's greed, but a lot of times you have to put yourself in their shoes. If you're at a dead end job, you have nothing going for you. You don't have the money to go to college. You don't want to get in debt, fair play. Where do you go, right? As you said, there's somebody who's there saying they believe in you. They believe you can make six figures. You know, you're, you're going to believe in that. And so I really felt like it made a lot more sense to tackle it from the other side, from the side of people that can stop, that can basically be exposed and basically be, um, have sort of like a negative put on their work. I mean, they're largely going under the radar. So I kind of felt like, you know, do you want to educate the, do you want to like blame it on the victims and say, you should have known better. You should have done this. You should stop. But there, there's no end, no end to that. Or do you go after the grifters themselves? And so that's what I realized. I realized like, that's the tactic that I went with. Um, and it's tough because it's a little like legally risky to do that. But um, yeah, you just kind of got to be smart about it, I guess. So your your platform has gotten really big. So there's some responsibility to that. Weirdly big, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's say. Because like only a year ago, it was like a lot, a lot smaller. And then it's hard to make that adjustment, you know? Because like to me, it's just the same. It's the same show I've been doing. Well, I mean, this is like less optically obvious. I think the main way is like my circle of friends doesn't care about any of that. Like and my wife doesn't care. The people that I, whose opinion I value has no relation to like a subscriber metric or anything like that. I think that's like tangibly the most important thing to just staying grounded. As far as like becoming a guru, I just don't have anything to like sell. I mean, I'm not interested in teaching people finance. I'm not interested in teaching people, not interested in selling a course. And I've kind of given myself a hard line on that, which I think has helped me a bit, is there's a temptation to go, well, I can tell what's a scam, so let me tell you what's not a scam. And a lot of people have offered a lot of money to do that and basically be like, hey, I have such and such legitimate product, come be like an endorser. And I just don't do that because I think it undermines a lot of what I do is if you get like, if you're taking money in on the side to say this is legit and you're saying this isn't legit, that's a huge conflict of interest. So I think it's about managing conflicts of interest and keeping people around me that are grounded. And also I think, um, yeah, my only interest really is just like make cool stuff. And I guess I'll do that until people stop watching. So. I think that's like goes back to what we've been talking about a lot, which is just on what you prioritize, what you value. I've just never, I guess I grew up kind of lower middle class and I had a great time. Like I had a great childhood. I had very loving parents. And because of that, I guess intuited at an early age that money doesn't do a whole lot. And I knew a lot of people who were way better off who had miserable childhoods. Because whether their dad was always gone at work or like they just had other family issues that just money can't buy. Mm -hmm. And I realized, I, I guess quickly, um, that money's a very like, it's a glittery object that isn't what it appears to be. And so to me, I'm like, I'm having the time of my life making my show. I'm not going to have the time. Like I could, you could ruin all that just trying to go for this quick check when it's like, no, I'm having a great time. Like, yeah. Brian Rose, he was sort of this interesting figure because he was like trying to be to one level or another, the Joe Rogan of London, mm -hmm. which I don't think he did a terribly bad job of, especially initially. He had some really interesting podcasts with some really interesting people. And uh, it's funny enough, I started out as a like, I would watch him. I mean, I don't know if I was like a huge fan, but I was like, I, I like some of his interviews. He had some really good, like big gets in terms of, you know, great guests. Um, however, when kind of COVID started, he went down this really weird grifting rabbit hole where he did like this interview with David Icke, who's, as you know, like a pretty big COVID conspiracy theorist. 
Um, and I mean like actual, like he believes some of the royals are literally lizards. Mm -hmm. um, so he got shut down for that. And uh, he kind of made a big stink, which it's I, I think it's fine. Nobody likes to be censored. And I'm not even saying that he should have been censored. But his reaction to that was to like raise a ton of money from his audience, promising this digital freedom platform. And at first it was like, oh, we want to raise $100,000. And then they raised it like within a day. So he's like, well, we got to raise a lot more money. And so eventually they raised a million dollars and he's trying to raise $250,000 a month to kind of keep putting his viewers' money into this stuff. So I started digging into the platform they were building and there was nothing free about it. They had censorship guidelines and there was nothing about a platform at all. There was no underlying infrastructure. He just got some white label uh, live streaming thing. So I criticized him for that. It was just this ridiculous thing. All the donators expected one thing. They they thought Brian Rose was gonna take on Google and Facebook and like bring free speech back for everybody. And of course he didn't. Um, and then it kind of got worse because he started taking a lot of heat for that. And he really pivoted hard into like the DeFi grift. So he started selling this course about DeFi mastery. And this is a guy who knows nothing about crypto um, or very little at the least. So it just got really kind of, he just kind of um, doubled down on this course model of you're going to be rich if you just follow me. And it was ultimately you just type in Brian Rose on, on YouTube, you can see what his audience thought of that because almost all of them have left him at this point. He's getting like a thousand views a video. And it wasn't because of me. I mean, it was like people lost taste in just the constant ask for more money, more money, more money. At some point, people get sick of it. And it's like everyone has an understanding that like no one works for free. But when it starts to be ego driven and driven around money everything's about money it uh it drives people away well you're a part of that sort of helping people. it's nice to have a voice yeah i certainly spoke out i mean it wasn't like i was quiet i was very loud about it at the time um but i mean in the sense that there if you look at someone like andrew tate i've made a video about him even though he's been banned off all the platforms he gets more views than brian rose and I think it's just like it was a testament to how much Brian Rose was like doing like the grift that people could, even people who were fans and didn't care about what I said, like couldn't look past, you know, just the constant ask for more and more money. People just get burnt out. Sure. I mean, I try to be sensitive to my platform. And as I've grown, I've tried to make sure my video topics have grown with me. Mm -hmm. And like, it does reach this tricky point where if you're exposing a grifter with like 50,000 subs, who's doing some harm, are you punching down? Right. And so far there's been enough high profile things that I can distract myself with to where this has never been a problem. You don't ever want to be, um, sort of like Sir Lancelot in retirement. Um, where have you heard this analogy? No. Okay, no. so there's this great analogy where it's <laughs> yeah. like, Sir Lancelot's the guy who s uh, slays the dragon, right? Mm -hmm. He gets a lot of fame and he gets a lot of fortune for saving the dragon, or at least a lot of, you know, people love him. But what happens after he slays the first dragon? He's got to go find a bigger dragon. So he goes, finds a bigger dragon. And eventually, depending on how many dragons you think are there in, in the world, Maybe he kills all the dragons. And one day people go see Sir Lancelot and he's in a field with cows and he's chopping their heads. <laughs> yeah. And he's yeah. he's sort of put himself in retirement, but he can't even enjoy the fruits because his whole thing is like, I'm killing the dragon. So I try to be cognizant and I try to always make myself willing to hang up my, <laughs> my suspenders, I guess, hang up my hat. I, I try to be aware, like yeah. if, I significantly improve the problem. I put myself out of business. I want to be okay with that, basically. Um, and just and, be fine with it. I don't, the funny thing is, I was more worried about this as like an issue earlier because I thought there was a finite, like, I was like, man, I'm going to solve this faster, especially as it started gaining traction. Like, I'm going to solve this fast. I got this, you know? 
classic naive. Yeah. Um, you know, we all think yeah. we're so influential. FTX comes along. Well, yeah, and you just, these... you just, yeah, you just get like, uh, with time you get humbled because you talk to people. I've talked to like versions of CoffeeZilla that are older. And it's like, it's like, oh yeah, they didn't solve it. And they probably were better. At sure. Great investigations reveal something new or bring something to light. So I think what everyone thinks in terms of investigations is like a lot of like, you know, Googling or like searching through articles. I think uh, that's the first thing you want to get away from. And you want to try to j talk to people doing like the non-obvious things and just trying to get perspectives that are beyond just what is available. So a lot of it's just having conversations is so enlightening, um, both to victims and also obviously trying to get talk to the people themselves. Secondly, there's sometimes some analysis you can generate that's meaningful, like blockchain evidence. Mm -hmm. So in the case of SafeMoon, for example, uh, going back to that, I found someone's secret account where they were pumping, dumping coins. They were saying things like, who sold? I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'm so mad at the guy who sold, F the guy who sold. And you look at his account and he was the guy selling. Yeah. And it's like, that is just, that's great stuff. So digging through the blockchain, kind of, I've gained some skills there. Um, and that's kind of this fun, I guess I would say it's this weird edge I have for right now, because a lot of people don't know too much about that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have this weird expertise that works now. I don't think that'll work forever because I think people will kind of figure out how to do very similar analyses. But uh, so it's it's like kind of an interesting edge right now that I have. So that's like a data-driven investigation. But you also do interviews, right? Yeah, definitely. And then also recently I've tried to get more response. Speaking to your point about like as your platform gets bigger, you need more responsibility. I've tried to get much more um, responsible about like reaching out or somehow giving the subject some way to talk because I think in early on, I was such a small channel that A, I, if I asked them, they wouldn't answer. Mm -hmm. But B, I kind of felt like I was launching these videos into the abyss. And when some of my videos had real traction, I was like, okay, hang on a second. Let's double check this. Let's triple check it. Let's try to make sure um, all this stuff is correct. And there's no other side of the story. I'll say this has interesting implications because for example, I investigated this thing called Genesis. They're a billion dollar crypto lender. And my conclusion was that they were insolvent. That's a huge accusation. So what do you do? Well, I emailed their press team, everybody. I said, hey, I think you're insolvent. I think you're this. I think I laid out all my accusations. And I said, you have till, I think, 2 p.m. the next day to respond. Mm -hmm. At 8 a.m., before I made my video, they announced to all their investors that they're freezing withdrawals. They don't have the money. So they front... I, I don't know if they saw the inner, like, I don't know if they actually saw that email. I don't want to take credit yes, for yes, yes. collapsing them or whatever. But my point is, had I not taken that level of kind of care and just said, hey, you're a, you're a scammer, you're frauds. Ironically, could I have done more good by allowing people to withdraw their money early? Mm -hmm. I made some tweets that people did see that like some people got their money out, but my YouTube audience is much larger. And could I have helped more people had I not? given them basically the ability to know what I was going to produce when I produced it. You know, it's interesting. It surprises me. I know it surprises other people because other people have commented, but it consistently surprises me how many people still talk to me. Uh, it's, and maybe it's because they, and I really do give a good attempt to try to argue in good faith. I try not to just like load up ad hominems or anything like that. I just try to present the evidence and let the audience make up their mind. Um, but it surprises me sometimes that people will just be like, yeah, they want to talk, they want to talk, they want to talk. I think it's very human in a way. And I think it's like almost, it's almost like good. Like one of the things that is always told to everyone who's going to talk to the cops is like, you should never talk to the cops, whatever. Um, which is true. You shouldn't talk to the cops. Because because even if you're innocent, they can use your words, they can twist your words, da, da, da. but there's something that, that gets lost in that like almost robotic, like, you know, self-interest that I think having open conversations, even if you've done something wrong, I think there's something really compelling about that, that continues to make people talk in interrogation rooms, in Twitter spaces, wherever you are, regardless of whether you totally shouldn't be talking. And 
I don't want to downplay that. That's actually really important. I mean, it's like a lot of cases get solved. A lot of investigations go farther because people sort of make the miscalculation to talk. But I think it's like almost important in a way that we have that human bias to like connect in spite of self-interest. Can, can I tell you an example? Yeah. I'm dying because I, I believe so strongly that journalists have done themselves such a disservice. Okay. One of the truest things is that like everyone loves journalism in theory and almost everyone dislikes journalists as a whole. Like yeah. there's a deep distrust of journalists and there's a deep love for journalism. Yeah. It's this weird disconnect. I think a lot of it can be summarized in, there's this book called the, the uh, God, what it's called. I think it's called The Journalist and the Murderer. It's written by Janet Malcolm. The first line of this book is that like every journalist who knows what they're doing, who isn't too, like, is smart enough to know what they're doing, knows what they're doing is deeply unethical mm -hmm. or something like that. And what they're talking about is that there's a tradition in journalism to betray the subject, to lie to them in the hopes of getting a story and play to their ego and to their sense of self to make it seem like you're going to write one article and you stab them in the back at the end when you press publish and you write the totally different article. Yeah. This is what actually everyone hates about journalists. And it's happened to me before. So I did a story like way back in the day, I got interviewed about something that was like data with YouTube. I made a few comments about data and YouTube. And somehow by the time the article got published, it's about me endorsing their opinion that PewDiePie is an anti-Semite. And I'm like, I reach out to this person. I said, I never said that. Like, what are you talking? How did you even twist my words to say that? And I felt so disgusted and betrayed to have like, I'm like this mouthpiece for an ideology or like a thought that I do not actually agree with. So, and when journalists do this, they think, well, I'm never going to interview this person again. So it's okay. So it's like, it's almost like the ends justify the means. I get the story. But the ends don't justify the means because you've now undermined the entire field's credibility with that person. And when that happens enough time, times, you end up sitting across from Lex Friedman and it's like, well, I don't know if they're going to represent me fairly. Because the base assumption is that regardless of what the journalist says, they could betray you and they might betray you at the end of the day and be saying you're great while they're secretly writing like a hit piece about like, you know, how much, you know, you're a bad person force for the world where, whereas there's an alternate universe where if the journalist was somewhat upfront about their approach, or at least didn't mislead and didn't say like, I love you. I, I think you're great. Um, you would end up with less access, but you would end up with more trusted journalism, which I think in the long run would be better. I think you get more access. I think in the long term, yeah, but all of these, like everything we're talking about is long-term games versus short-term games. Yeah. In the short term, you get more access if you suck up to the person, if you say this, say this, say this, and you stab them in the back later. Long-term, you build a long-term reputation, people trust you, it actually matters more. But That is what's interesting about, yeah, independent, the move independent, towards yeah. independent journalism. Um, I think we'll probably end up at a space where it's so interesting. Mainstream journalism has so much work to do to repair the trust with the average individual. Um, and it's going to take a lot of like self-reflection. I've talked to a few mainstream journalists about this and a lot of them will admit it behind closed doors, but like there's this general sense that, oh, the public's not being fair to us. Like they're very self, they're defensive, I guess, in a mm -hmm. way. And I understand why, because Sometimes it's just a few bad apples that ruin it for everybody, but without the acknowledgement of the deep distrust that they have with a good portion of our society, there's no way to rebuild that. Just like when there's no acknowledgement of the corruption of the 2008 financial crash, there's no way to rebuild that. Even if most bankers, most traders are not unethical or duplicitous or they're totally normal people with who maybe aren't deserving of the bad reputation, but you have to acknowledge the damage that's been done by bad actors before you can like heal that system. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I saw a lot of, I'm like in this weird thing where I see, I'm so 
I follow a lot of independent people and I follow a lot of mainstream journalists and the, the, there's very polar opposite takes on that. Hopefully so. I don't, yeah, it's, it's been tribalized so quickly. It's like, I've lost a lot of faith in that. Right. And unfortunately it's right. been this like bludgeon match of like, you know, if you're on the right, you think it's uncovering the greatest story ever about Hunter yeah. Biden. If you're on the left, you think they were just sharing, they were just silencing revenge porn pics of Hunter Biden. So therefore it was justified. And by the way, Trump also sent messages to Twitter. So doesn't that mean that like we should be criticizing Trump? It just like, right. it, this is goes back to why I don't touch politics is because I think as yeah. many problems as I have, I think when you become a polit like a journalist that not even a political journalist, when you become a journalist in politics, you have like twice the problem. So I'm like, I'm happy to be well outside of that um, kind of sphere. What do you think about Twitter? I'm, I'm always conflicted on Twitter because I almost hate how much I enjoy using it. Because mm -hmm. I'm like, this is like this mindless bird app is consuming my time. Mm -hmm. um, it's this incredible networking tool. But what's weird is when I think about my own presence on Twitter, they've almost made it too easy to like say something that you've half thought. Like the friction to send a tweet is so much less than like, if I'm going to make a YouTube video, there's several points at which I'm like, well, what's the other side? What's this? What's that? There's no friction there. And so one thing I've noticed is everyone I follow on Twitter, a lot of them, after reading all their tweets, I think nothing more of them, nothing less of them. But there's a lot of them that I think less of. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I've ever had a, an experience where I've read, read someone's tweets and I think more of them in a way. And I'm like, what does that say that... Reflect, like, it's impossible to not reflect it to some extent. Or you'd have to counter that bias really carefully because that is them. It is a thought they had. It's just probably something that should have been an unexpressed <laughs> thought, perhaps. Um, so, yeah, yeah I, I, I kind of wonder, like, my, I'm like, should I be on Twitter? But the problem is, is it's such a great place where so many, like, so much of the news happens on Twitter, so much of the journalism breaks on Twitter. Even people in the New York Times, they'll tweet their scoop. Yeah. And they'll, like, they'll put that out on Twitter first. So it's this really weird thing where I'd love to be off it. And it's like too useful for my job, but I kind of, I kind of hate it. Uh, and are usually the ones that are extreme, more extreme. Yeah. And like emotional, like Lex is an idiot or like Lex is the greatest human yeah. being ever. Yeah. It's much better than, oh, wow. What a polite, nuanced conversation. I can tell you right now, which of those three tweets it isn't going to perform well. It's historic. It's they might historic. not have even read the article. They yeah. just like, they literally, or the tweet thread, and they're just like, it is historic. Uh, historic. It... Never. Yeah, nowhere else. Because he wasn't going to come on my show. He wasn't going to come on some big prepared thing. It's like, hey, YOLO, let's go on a Twitter space. And I like pop up. And you know, it's funny. And this, I hope this release is late enough. Or, well, SPF probably won't see this. Yeah. Um, although I'm sure he's, a I, and unfortunately, unfortunately he will. Oh, Wait, okay. yes. Well, <laughs> hopefully I'll have time to enact my little plan, but, okay. um, I'm hoping if he goes on any future spaces, I can like haunt him from mm -hmm. interview to interview, which is like, I keep showing up and he's like, ah, oh, I hate this guy. Yeah. I, I mean, I've gone the gamut of, from obsessive time tracking in 15 minute buckets mm -hmm. to, kind of like the the other extreme where it's more um, kind of like large scale, some deep work here, two hour bucket, you know, account for an hour of lunch and some other thing. But now, now I just roughly, because I manage a team and there's some things that kind of come up. I, it's only a team of two, it's not like big, but I just have things that are not necessarily controllable by me. I like have to take some meetings or whatever. It's not as easy to plan out my day ahead of time. So I do a lot of, retrospective time management where I look at my day and that's what I mostly do now. Um, and I account, did I spend this day productively? What could I do better? And then try to implement it in the future. So a lot of this I realized is very personal for me. I do very well in long streaks of working. And if I, I can't do a lot of work in 15 minutes, I can't do a lot of work in 
even an hour. But if you give me like three hours or five hours or six hours of uninterrupted work, that's like, that's where I get most of my stuff done. Yeah, I would kind of do it live. Um, I'm not, so one of the reasons I'm so obsessive about it is because I'm not organized by nature. Mm -hmm. And I lost, like in college, I learned how much lack of organization can just hurt you in terms of output. And so I realized like I just had to build systems that would enable me to become more organized. So uh, really, I think I think that doing that really taught me a lot about time in the same way that tracking calories can teach you about food. Yes. Like just learning accounting for these things will give you skills that eventually you might not need to track on such a granular level because you've kind of like figured out. So that's kind of how I feel about it. I think everyone should if you care about productivity and stuff, should do a little bit of it. I don't think it's sustainable in the long term. It just takes so much effort and time to like, and I think the marginal effect of it in the long term is kind of minimal once you learn these basic skills. But um, yeah, I was basically tracking like live what I did. And what I saw is that a lot of my real work would be done in small sections of the day. And then it'd be like a lot of just nothing. Like a lot of small things where I'm busy, but little is being achieved. And so I think that's a really interesting insight. I've never figured out how to unbusy myself and focus on the like core essentials. I'm still getting to that. But um, it is interesting realizing most of your day is like a lot of nothing. And then like some real deep work where most of your value comes from is like 20% of your day. Piano. Piano. And uh, so like keeping that regular thing is sure. part of your life. And one thing that I've really taken from this is because I've read all the like, I had a self-improvement phase in my early 20s. Um, and one thing you learn is that everyone wants to give you a broad general solution. But really, the real trick of figuring out like optimizing is figuring out the things that work for you specifically. So like yeah. one interesting thing you said is like, oh, I like to do my hard work at the beginning of the day. Um, I know a lot of people recommend this. I've tried so many times and I just do better work late at night. And so usually my streak of work is like from like after dinner, 7.30 to like 2 a.m. That's my prime time. Um, and so like a lot of my videos, which you'll see, which is like lit from this studio, which appears to be daytime. It's like shot at 3 a.m., mm -hmm. you know, just like in a caffeine fueled rush. Um, but that's kind of how it works for me. And then also like with the social outlets and stuff like that, which it's easy. And I know, I feel like we think similarly on this. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to discount these things as less relevant because they don't have quantitative metrics associated with them. But in terms of longevity and like, I think to be able to do creative work, there's an amount of recharge and like re-inputting stuff that is frequently discounted by people like us who are like obsessed with, you know, quantitative metrics. And so I really found that some of the, my best work gets done after I take like a break or I like, I'll, I'll go play like live sets uh, of music. And I mean, like, that's like for me really recharging, but nowhere on a spreadsheet is, th is that going to show up as productive or like meaningful. But for me, for whatever reason, it recharges me in a way that like, I need to pay attention. <laughs> I can tell this is for anyone who has, you know, I've been the audience forever. So I, I haven't been on this side of the table before. You're very intense. You look right in the eye. It's a great question. So funny enough, before I did this, I was like an incorrigible optimist. I, everything, the sun shined every which place. Um, I always saw like everybody is fundamentally good. Nobody was bad. It just was like sort of bad, wrong place, wrong time, bad incentives. That view has darkened significantly. Uh, but I just try to remember, remember my sample set and just like, I'm just sampling sort of the worst. And, uh, I try not to let it bleed into my day-to-day -day life. And I think I've, I think it's probably because I was such an optimist early on that I've, I've been able to kind yeah. of retain some of it. I call it enlightened optimism, like choosing to be optimistic in the face of a realistic sense of the problems in the world 
and with a realistic sense of like the scale and the challenge ahead. Um, I, I actually think it's much braver to be an optimist when you're aware of what's going on in the world than to be a cynic. I think being a complete cynic is maybe, I'm not saying it's wrong, but I'm saying it's maybe the easier way just mentally to cope with so much negativity. It's like just saying, well, it's all bad. It's all doomed to fail. It's all going to go bust is easier. No, it it can be. Some people are naive that are optimistic, but but oftentimes, um, just because someone's optimistic does not mean they're naive. They could be be full well aware of how troubling the world is. Yeah, I think it's. I really have, um, especially in recent years, tried to somewhat depersonalize my work and um see it almost like as like a i don't know like a force of nature that i'm fighting more than like individuals because of this exact thing i think like sort of therefore but the grace of god there go i is kind of a really profound way to understand yourself rather than as just like fundamentally good and like in full of integrity acknowledging that so much of that is a product of your environment and your family and your upbringing and so much of the people who don't have that is a product of their environment. It doesn't absolve them, but it gives you more perspective to tr- like to sort of deal fairly, if that makes sense, and not approach it from a place of anger or a place of outrage. There is a sense of like sadness for the victims. There's a sense of outrage for the victims, but approach the individual who's done the thing from that place of understanding of this isn't just this person. There's like a whole broader thing going on here. Uh, it's a great, well, let me think about this for a second. I think don't be afraid to go against the grain and sort of challenge the expectations on you. Um, like you sort of have to do this weird thing where you acknowledge how difficult it will be to achieve something great while also having the courage to go for it anyways. And understanding that other people don't have it figured out, I think is a big theme of my work, which is that everyone wants like the guru to show them the way, to show them the secrets. So much of life and achieving anything is learning to figure it out yourself and like the meta skill of being an autodidactic where you can, I don't know if I said that word right. You basically, you self-teach. You learn the meta skill of like learning to learn. Mm -hmm. I think that's such an underrated aspect of education. People leave education, they go, when am I gonna use two plus two? When am I gonna learn, you know, use calculus? But so much of it is learning this higher level abstract thinking that can apply to anything. And getting that early on is um, incredibly powerful. So yeah, I would say like a lot of it is, is I guess to some extent, like you kind of have to do that Steve Jobs thing where you realize that nobody else in the world is smarter than you. And that both means that like, they can't show you the perfect way, but it also means you could do great things and kind of chart your own path. I don't know. That's so cheesy. This is why I hate giving advice. (laughs) I feel like it's cheesy. I mean, and I don't think it is. I think my, uh, my journey is so full of luck and like, specific experience i wonder how generalizable it is but if i've learned anything and if i could talk specifically to myself i guess that's what i would say and also and also like be really comfortable failing i think um one of the best things that like you would never know about me just looking at my background that helped me was playing music live I had incredible amounts of stage fright yeah. growing up, mostly because I was terrible at piano. I was like sucked. And I specifically, I taught myself how to play and I joined jazz band in like high school, did it through college. I remember all my recitals, I messed up every single solo I ever did. I never like actually nailed it. Mm. And every time I'd go up there, I'd like have so much dread around this. And uh, it was easier to get up there because there were sort of some people up there. 
But eventually I started like playing live too. And I sucked at that. And I've just gone through the trenches of like, just like being publicly sort of in my mind, humiliated, mm -hmm. like per that prepared me so much for what I do now of trying to basically being fearless of failure in the face of like a wide audience. I don't have that anymore because kind of I've experienced so many iterations of it at a smaller scale of just like abject public humiliation to where it's like not something that bothers me. I have no stage fright that doesn't bother me anymore. But you'd think like, oh, maybe he just was always good at this. I was terrible at it. I had a complete phobia about public anything. So um, it was that rapid iteration of just failure. And eventually I just like came to the conclusion of like, I want to love it. I want to like love like getting up on a stage and bombing. If you can learn to like love that and be fearless there, there's almost nothing you can't do. I think I think open mics are the best place to learn, though, because it's the lowest stakes you can get yeah. while still being public. If you're going to face like fears around this, because we're talking very specifically like public speaking or any kind of like, you know, being in front of a camera, if you're going to face your fear, you have to do it. And the easiest way to do it is to lower the stakes. You're not going to start being Lex Friedman on stage with a huge band. You don't want to be like it's like in that way. It is so impossible. Um but it, the more you lower the stakes and just like open it up to like two strangers, five strangers, like the, the most dive bar open mic you can go to and like start performing. That's that's really what I did is like like I love open mics now because it's like low stakes on the one hand, but you really get the feeling of like. Mm -hmm. This is the Lex Free Podcast.